Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode three of Pod Hacks on the YouTube. I uh, hope you guys noticed that there was a slight difference between episode one and episode two, right? That's me getting a little bit more comfortable in front of the camera, one, but also uh, a different editing type things. And I'm going to try to do a little bit more as we continue to go forward, right? I may not have as many like picture in picture type things, but I will have like little notes and stuff on the screen. And I've, I've got a little bit different apps. I've watched YouTube tutorials, <laughs> right, to figure out how to do even more as we continue to grow and continue to move forward. Uh, please give me your feedback. All of it, everything, even if you're just going to like dog on me for 20, 30 minutes or just like a long paragraph of just how much you just hate how I do things. <laughs> I haven't received any bad uh, reviews yet. So, I mean, that's a good thing. But if you have one, I'm not I'm not afraid to listen to them. But tell me like why what I'm doing that you guys don't like what I do that you do like. That's what helps grow the show. Right. I go back and listen to them uh, when I can as much as I can so that I can can grow myself. Right. And I've asked people, I got my brothers, I got people that I work with, I got a, a lot of people that I'm just telling them, hey, what what do you like? What do you don't like? Well, how can I tweak it? How can I make it better? Right? It goes a long ways. And you can do that, of course, by going to my Instagram, just a Reyes. You can go to my Twitter, just a Reyes13. You can go to my website, just a Reyes.com. Hope you guys get the theme there. And uh, you can contact me on any one of those. You can also email me info at just a Reyes.com or info dot just a Reyes at gmail.com. Any one of those is acceptable to get a hold of me. And, and I promise you, I will get back to you as soon as I can. There's, there's days at work. So I just got off this weekend. It's kind of why this episode isn't out like on Monday, Tuesday. Like I was hoping uh, it's coming out on Thursday. Because like this week I worked like 60 plus hours um, right at work. And I try to get things done during that time. So I try to use those times that I'm working as uh, like research times. But I also have school going on right now. So I got a lot of things that are kind of mixing into one. Now, once school is done, right, and then uh, it'll be a little bit more easier to put a little bit more energy into this. But rest assured, I still put a lot of energy into this. Like uh, between the YouTube and the podcasting version, I'm putting over 40 hours per episode into all of this. And that's to make it the best content that I can make it. And uh, researching, not just like researching per episode, per show, but also researching, researching like how to improve like the sound quality or like the video quality or uh, what can I do as far as like editing goes. Um, all those different things, right? Because it's just, it's a learning process and a growth process. And I'm going to continue to learn. I'm going to continue to grow. I'm going to continue to do like whatever I can to make this the best that I can make it, right? That's my goal is to, right? It was my goal to learn how to do this. It was my goal to uh, talk baseball with people. Um, those things are going in the right direction. It's also my goal to do the best that I can at whatever I'm doing, right? I'm not I'm not just going to throw things out. I'm not going to sit in front of a camera and just start talking nonsense to you guys and hope that everyone wants to listen to it. No, I get this now. Where I don't I want I don't want to sit and watch somebody just talk nonsense in front of a camera for uh, 30 minutes. So that's not what I'm going to do for you guys. Uh, so please give me your feedback on what you guys like, what you guys don't like. Um, if there's an episode that you guys want to hear, different type of episode, because, I mean, baseball's still not being played, and they're looking like, uh, right, end of May is, like, best case scenario. Uh, hopefully, that's when games start get going again. Uh, but but in the meantime, what do you guys want to listen to, right? So I have this episode. I have uh, next week's episode that'll be about uh, stadiums, right, old spring training stadiums. That'll be episode five, or sorry, four of the YouTube version, 21 of the podcast version. And then I'm going to go to the NL side, right? So this is the AL playoff side. Then we'll go to the NL playoff side and episode uh, five and episode 22. I got to get those, right? <laughs> those are definitely the next two episodes. And I have a few ideas, right? Um, so we're talking about possible canceled uh, seasons. Um, so we can even talk about uh, the strike, right? The year in the 90s where uh, baseball didn't have a, a playoffs or a World Series at all. Um, we can talk about the World Series that had an earthquake in the middle of it, right? Between the Giants and the eight and the A's, all those different things are are really good ideas and viable ideas to have. But what do you guys want to listen to? Just let me know. Leave a, a comment right here. Again, you can research reach me. All of my contact information will be in the episode description. At any time, get a hold of me. Uh, as soon as I see it, as soon as I get there, I will get back to you. Uh, so please, please do that. But let's get into the episode. Enough of me rambling in front of you guys. A quick refresher for you guys that don't remember what happened during the 2019 playoffs on the American League side. Well, this is what happened. The Oakland A's finished the season at 97 and 65 and hosted the wild card game, which they lost to the Tampa Bay Rays. I believe it was five to one. The Rays went on to face the Astros 
and they took the Astros to the brink. So the Astros won two games in Houston. Tampa went back to Tampa, and they won their two games before losing in Game 5 uh, to Garrett Cole with a dominant outing in, in, in Houston. The Twins on the other side played the Yankees, and they were out quick. Uh, it was not a great showing from the Minnesota Twins. Uh, so they were done, and they were swept. The Yankees went on to face the Astros, and the Astros won that in six games. Uh, it was, was like a very competitive series to begin with, and then the, the Yankees started to falter a bit towards those last few games. Uh, they held on a little bit in game, with a win in Game 5, but the, the series was kind of over after – it felt over after the Astros. They lost Game 1 again, then they just rolled through three games. Astros went on to the World Series to face the Nationals, and they lost to the Washington Nationals in seven games with the Nationals winning – all four games in Houston. That was the crazy part. They won all four games in Houston, and the Astros won all four, three games in, in Washington, which is the first time in sports history that a seven-game series, championship game series, was won by the road team on all seven games. So that was a quick recap of um, what happened during the playoffs. We'll kind of cover it as we go over these different teams, but that's what happened during the 20, 2019 MLB playoffs on the American League side. The Oakland A's, as we mentioned, they were 97-65. They were the first wildcard team. They, they, were, they finished a game ahead of Tampa Bay. Uh, they finished second in the AL West. And this was actually the second year in a row that they went 97-65. So in 2018, Bob Melvin, their manager, was manager of the year. They went 97-65. 2019, they won 97-65 again. Uh, they didn't really make a whole lot of offseason moves. Usually they, they do make a few different offseason moves as far as like um, – Lower level guys, they don't spend a whole lot of money. It's like Tampa. They don't spend a whole lot of money, but they may make like little trades for like different prospects. They may make um, different moves for like some veteran arms to kind of fill out a roster. They didn't really do a whole lot of that. So they traded away Jerks and Profar to San Diego for a couple prospects. That's their prospect move. Uh, Austin Allen and Buddy Reed. Uh, and then they let Homer Brayley go. They let Blake Trinan go. And then they went out and traded for Tony Kemp to fill that void at second base now that Profar is gone. Now, Profar is a good young player, but he just wasn't getting it done in Oakland, especially defensively. Maybe a switch to San Diego is just what he needs. We kind of talked about that when we talked about the Padres in the past. Uh, adding Tony Kemp brings them a veteran type guy. He's not going to do much for you at the dish, but he's fast. He's going to get on base, and he's going to play decent defense. Um, so those are their offseason moves, and that's kind of it. They also lost Homer Bailey. So they let Homer Bailey and, and Blake Trinan go, but as you'll see, it's not a big issue that they let um, Homer Bailey go. This team is led by their defense, uh, big time by their defense. They have a decent bats, especially as you'll see, you have Matt Chapman on in the left field, right? I mean, <laughs> on the left-hand side at third, you have Matt Olson on the right-hand side at first. And those are their two big names. Like, those are their two leaders, right? Marcus Simeon at shortstop finished third in the, the AL MVP vote. And he, he's very, very good, right? And he helps kind of fill that, that infield, right? Now they have uh, Tony Kemp there at second. But Chapman and Olson are their leaders. Those, those are their guys. You have Mark Canna in center field. Well, actually, it's going to be Ramon uh, Luriano now. Uh, you have a few different guys that are going to rotate in that outfield position, and they have a young catcher coming up. But pitching side was where they kind of struggled last year, and it wasn't because they didn't have the talent. It's because it's young, and they didn't throw a little, whole lot of innings. So you're looking at – it was last year they were led by Mike Fires. Mike Fires is 34 years old now. Uh, he went three, uh, he went 15-4 with a 3.90 ERA, but he threw in 184 innings. But his strikeouts were 126. So he, and that's kind of what you're going to get from him. He's just a veteran arm. He's going to eat up innings. He's not going to give up a whole lot. 3 9 is, is decent, right? It's not going to blow you away, but it's it's solid. And that's kind of what you want from him. He's not going to be their ace this year. That's the reality of it. But he was kind of their ace last year because he was, he was forced to. And he did an admirable job of it. He was a respectable pitcher. And if you remember, Mike Fires is the guy that kind of blew the lid off of the Astros thing. He was the, the one that talked to the athletic. Let them know that the sign stealing gate was happening, that the rumors <laughs> were, were true, and all that. So uh, he has a lot of uh, friends and enemies throughout the league now. Uh, he's a very eccentric guy. He's got the the famous swirl, right beard that like went like this. <laughs> uh, but he's a 34 year old pitcher. He's going to be a solid veteran arm for them. But this team is going to be led by probably Sean Mania. He's going to be their ace. Uh, he only threw in 30 innings last year, or actually 29 and two-thirds, so 30 innings. He got 30 strikeouts in that point, and he had a 1-2-1 whip ERA and a 0 0.78 whip. So he was really good in that short amount of time. However, he was their uh, wild card game starter. Didn't go as well as the regular season went. He went two innings. He gave up three home runs, four runs in those three home runs. He had 5K, zero walks. But he's 28 years old. 
he didn't have a whole lot of tune-up. And as you'll see, Tampa just kind of came out swinging in the playoffs. Like their offense that usually struggles wasn't struggling. They were healthy and they were ready to roll. So Sean and I have a very, very good young pitcher, 28 years old. And uh, I continue, expect him to continue to improve. He's definitely not going to miss the first three, four months of the season this year like he did last year. All right, he didn't throw till end of August, beginning of September. Uh, he's healthy. He's ready to go now. Next up will be probably Frankie Montes. He's a 26-year-old. He dealt with injuries again last year as well. He did manage to get 96 innings in, which is decent. But, I mean, it's still, I mean, 96 is not 190, right? That, which is what they're going to kind of expect from him and Manaya and Lazardo and Puck. Uh, but Montes, a young fireballer, 103 strikeouts in those 96 innings. He was a top fight prospect for the Dodgers for a long time. Uh, him and Gerald Cotton, I believe, were in that deal for Josh H or Rich Hill and Josh Reddick, uh, 2016, for the Dodgers. And, and Montes has continued to develop. He's 26 years old. Jesus Lazardo, 22 years old, one of their top prospects coming up. He only threw in 12 innings last year as he came up in September for a bit of a cup of coffee, right? Uh, really good in those innings. He had a 1.50 ERA. He had 16 strikeouts in 12 innings. He had a 0.67 whip. Another really young, good pitcher. Uh, A.J. Puck is their highest regarding prospect as a pitcher. He will be 25 this month. And he went 11 innings last year. Uh, still, it was really good, right? A 13 strikeouts in those 11 innings. But all those guys are really, really young and just developing. And you can see why, like, you'll look at the team total stats. They were 26 in strikeouts. That's because they're strikeout guys, right? Manaya, Montes, Lazardo, Puck, all these young guys, right? Uh, Manaya being the oldest at 28, weren't really in the bigs last year because either injury or they're too young and they're making their way up to it. That's going to change this year. That's going to change in 2021, right? Mike Fires was there kind of leading the way with them last year. He's going to slide down to... If all things go well, probably their number five starter. And then you're looking at those numbers as number five starter, you're thinking, man, that's that's a one through five that's really, really good. Like You look at somebody different whenever they're leading the, the rotation as opposed to, right? I mean, that's just kind of natural. Uh, again, it's going to go Manaya, probably go Montes, and then see what Lazardo and Puck can do as they get into the league. Montes has a little bit more innings under his belt, uh, a little bit more stretching them out, right? So when a young guy comes up, they don't like to throw him so many innings. They want to get his arms stretched out and warmed up and ready to do that. Uh, so that's what's probably going to happen with Lazardo and Puck this year, especially if it's an abbreviated season as there's double headers and less off days. They're, they're probably going to ease these guys into it. If they can get like 100, 120, 30 innings into them, get ready for the postseason, you're feeling really good. And how they're going to do that is with guys like Chris Bassett, Brett Anderson, and Tanner Roark. Veteran guys kind of go along with Mike Fires, and they're going to come in there and give them some games, eat up some innings for them, help them develop these guys moving forward. But that's a young rotation that looks really, really good moving forward, right? They haven't had like a dominant rotation in Oakland since the like Mark Mulder days, right? Barry Zito, Tim Hudson, those guys. This might be, man, this might be it because they're – Highly regarded prospects with a lot of good stuff right there. Uh, the, the total pitching staff, we won't really go into it again. Uh, they they ended up with 6th in the ERA, 5th in whip, and 7th in batting average against, which is decent, right? But the low strikeout rate, all those numbers are, are bound to change because the ro their rotation isn't going to be the same as it was in 2019. Their bullpen, however, probably will look the same as it did towards the end of, of 2019. Uh, they have a closer Liam Hendricks right now, and uh, they showed a picture of his, uh, I think it's a knuckle curve. It's just filthy. <laughs> uh, I can't remember what Instagram page it was on, uh, but it just filthy. He ended up with a 1.8 ERA. He had 124 strikeouts in 85 innings. He had a 0.96 WHIP and 25 saves. All really, really good. Now he didn't open their year as their star as their closer, right? It was Blake Trinan. He was kind of their their secondary guy. Uh, and he's a bit of an older reliever, kind of like Kirby Yates in San Diego. Uh, but he's really good. Still, I mean, he's still not like I'm knocking on the door of retirement. Uh, but he's not going to be like a dominant closer for the next six years. But he will be really good for the next three, four years. Uh, the team as a total only had 45 saves in 77 opportunities. It's not that they lost in those other 32 games. It's just that they couldn't hold down the lead in the bullpen in those games. Big part of it was the struggles and the injuries to Blake Trinan as they were trying to kind of solidify that closing spot. Liam Hendricks stepped up and was that for them. I expect that to continue into 2020. On the offensive side of things, as we mentioned, Really, really good defensively. So they had Mark Simeon, who was a gold glove runner-up, to Francisco Lindor, who's just insane defensively. They have Matt Chapman, who was not only a gold glover again, but was a platinum glove winner. So gold glovers are the best defensive players at that position in that league. 
Platinum Glove winners are the best defensive players in the league, regardless of position. So you have one in the AL, one in the NL, as opposed to, what, 10 and 10? No, you have one and one. And the last two years has been Matt Chapman, third baseman for the A's, and Nolan Arenado, third baseman for the Rockies. And a cool story of that is they were actually high school teammates at one point. I think Chapman is a couple years younger. That when, so whenever Arenado graduated, Chapman was a sophomore or a freshman. But they were on the same high school team, which is crazy. The best defensive players in all of baseball playing together in the same high school team. They both play third base. Uh, Matt Olson, their first baseman, as we mentioned, he also was a Gold Glove winner. Robbie Grossman, Gold Glove runner-up. So defense abound for this team. Really, really good defensively. They can also hit a little bit. So as we talked about Ramon Liriano, he's kind of like on the Lazardo or the uh, Montes part where he got a little bit more innings than some of these younger guys, but he's still like building up. So next this year will be his, his opportunity to throw a lot more, uh, to be in a lot more games and to build his stats up. He still managed to hit 284 with 27 home runs and 76 RBIs, which is pretty solid. Marcus Simeon, as we mentioned, was third in the MVP vote. He had 25 home runs. He had an 892 OPS. His offense numbers aren't going to blow you away but you match them with uh, offensive numbers, what he did in August, September, which stood out more, right? So his numbers at the beginning of the year were a little bit lower and then just got super hot towards the end. And that's what helped build those numbers up. He also just played great defense uh, in this year. Matt uh, Chapman, he not only does he play elite elite defense, but he'll hit 32 home runs, 83 RBIs. He has a 250, uh, 258 average. You want to see get up a little bit more, but it's still not bad for what he brings to the table everywhere else. Matt Olson will also hit you 37 home runs and 94 RBIs. And again, those are your two leaders, right? Chapman and Olsen. You're talking about the A's, you're talking about Chapman and Olsen right now. Uh, those guys are just studs on the corner of their, their infield. Uh, Mark Hanna, another outfielder, as we mentioned, he's going to bounce around. He'll hit 26 home runs. Decent year for him. Chris Davis is a home run machine, usually 40 per year. Uh, last year, he only ended up with 35 because of injuries, but still, just a, a machine. Man. I think it was three or four years straight of him hitting uh, 248. 41 home runs and a or 241, sorry, and 100 plus RBIs. And last year he went 236, 35 home runs and 98 RBIs. So he didn't miss it by much. And a big part of that reason was he was hurt yeah, throughout the middle of the season, right? He had a, a big chunk of time in the middle of the season that kind of cost him. But he's a consistent DH, which is really good to have. And uh, he's one of the better DHs outside of the guy we're going to talk about here soon from the Minnesota Twins uh, coming up. But a really good DH. Robbie Grossman's also in that outfield, plays, right, he was a gold glove runner-up, as we mentioned a little bit ago. Doesn't bring you much at, at the offensive side of the ball, but he does bring you really good defense, so you kind of deal with it. I mean, it, the rest of the lineup is, is good enough to where you don't need one through nine to be elite. If he brings you a little bit more, right, he hit 252, if he can get that average up or be on base a little bit more, that's great for the rest of the lineup. Uh, Sean Murphy is a catcher. He ended up with 13 home runs and 42 RBIs. But he didn't have enough plate appearances or at bats to uh, qualify as having a full rookie year, so he's still a rookie coming into this next year. So, third, that I mean that small sample size, you got to feel pretty confident about, right? He's supposed to be really good defensively. He hit 255, which is a decent average for a catcher. Right, catchers usually don't have elite offensive type years, uh, but that's a pretty good sample size for for a young guy who didn't qualify as, again for a full season. Uh, he's going to be joining those those pitchers, Lazardo and Puck, trying to help bring them along. As similar as they played together in AAA, right, as they developed. So it's a nice little piece for them there. Again, Tony Kemp's going to fill in. Doesn't bring you much to the plate. Right, only four home runs last year, 20 RBIs. But he is going to bring you solid defense. He's going to bring you some speed. And similar to Grossman, right, if he can get on base a lot, he can bring that defense, and you're very happy with what he's got because you have enough offense outside of those two guys to, to make up for whatever they lack. As a team last year, they finished 16th in average. Again, you can kind of see why those averages need to get up, right? They're elite guys. Uh, Simeon, 270, uh, 258 for Chapman, 254 for Olsen. You'd like to see those things go up a little bit more. Uh, but home runs, they finished 5th. They finished ninth in RBIs, 10th in OPS, uh, 24th in strikeouts. They don't strike a whole lot. 10th in rocks, so they walk more than they strike out. Again, with that pitching staff continuing to develop, these guys are young still, right? Simeon's yeah, still pretty young. Liriano's really young. Um, Murphy, their catcher, really young. Chapman and Olsen aren't that old. Canna's not very old either. They're going to continue to get better. This is a very, very good Oakland A's team who is going to be challenging the Astros for, for years to come. All right, if the Astros, unless the Astros falter, we'll kind of get into that in a bit. But they are, they're definitely going to be there fighting for the crown this year for the American League West. Uh, GM, again, is Bob Melvin, won the manager of the year in 2018. 
He has been with the team since 2011, so he's been there a long time, and that's kind of what the A's do. And as I mentioned, the Rays will get into it. They do the same thing. They kind of hold on to what they got, and they just let him develop and continue to grow. And that's been the kind of the MO of Billy Bean, the executive VP of baseball, who's been there since the 90s. He was a big part of that Moneyball type era, right? He helped kind of bring it along, and he's helped this A's team stay low on their payroll and continue to be competitive, and that's just what they do. Uh, their GM is David Forrest, but Billy Bean is the, kind of the main guy there. They are 24th in payroll, as you mentioned, keep it low, 86.8 million. And I want to say the league average is like 130.8 million, and I have it written, I think, for the Twins. So they're well below <clears throat> the league minimum as far as our median as far as the, their salary goes, they don't pay a whole lot out. They still have a lot of room to prove there. Uh, they have the 14th ranked farm system, which is pretty decent, especially when you consider that uh, Luriano did graduate from there, and they don't need a whole lot of spots filled in. And all three of their top 100 prospects, they have three of them, will be on the roster this year, right? Lazardo, Puck, Murphy. We talked about those guys. They will be in the lineup this year. They'll probably lose their rookie status, uh, barring any sort of injury, knock on wood. Um, so the team is going to continue to get better. They're going to continue to get younger. Yeah, but that'll do it for the Oakland A's. Good team. They continue to get good. That's just the way it goes. Uh, one last note before we move on. They are moving on to a different stadium here soon, sooner than later. And hopefully a newer stadium means a little bit more money pumped into them, a little bit more revenue, and then they can continue to add to this team in free agency. They don't have to just rely on homegrown people. They can hold on to guys like Chapman and Olsen. All right, similar guys to like Josh Donaldson, as we'll talk about right now, that develop there and they move on somewhere else. Maybe, maybe that new stadium kind of is a change in the guard for the Oakland A's. Uh, but let's move on. We'll move on to the Minnesota Twins. Minnesota Twins were 101 and 61 last year. And they kind of came out of nowhere uh, in a sense because they weren't really good in 2018. They were, the Indians just ran away with that division in 2018. Minnesota Twins come out of nowhere, went 101 games. Right? They finished first in the Central. The division series didn't go as well. <laughs> so they bounced back. They had a, a kind of come out of nowhere uh, regular season. They looked great, especially offensively. They were kind of elite offensively. And then the Yankees just kind of smacked them around. They went 10-4. and four. <laughs> They lost 10-4 in New York game one, 8-2 to New York in game two, 5-1 in Minnesota in game three, and that was it. They were the first team out. They were the only team in the division series. To, they were the only series not to go to five games. They were the only sweep in the division series. And I believe they were the only sweep in the playoffs in general. So it, it just, they had to improve. And where do they need to improve? They need to pit, improve upon the pitching side of the ball. So what do they do this offseason? They do make moves, unlike the A's and the Rays we'll talk about in a bit. December 20th, they signed Alex Avila to be a backup catcher for them, kind of help their, their young catcher out. They went out and get Tyler Clipper. A, he used to be an elite reliever, but it's just a solid veteran reliever for them now. They go out and sign Rich Hill, an older pitcher, really good when he's healthy. Uh, he's supposed to be out until like July, August, which the way the season's going means he's not going to miss a whole lot. He's going to be there uh, kind of towards the front or half of the season, <laughs> the front or half, the front half of the season, uh, opposed to like the back half, like they were kind of projecting him to be, which he still might be. Maybe this gives him more time to kind of rest up, but very, very good will help them as they go into the postseason. Homer Bailey came over from the A's. He had a decent year last year for them. Uh, we'll kind of go into his numbers a bit, but he's going to eat up innings. He's going to be a veteran type guy for them. Uh, they trade for Kenta Maeda from the Dodgers, another Dodger pitcher, right? They got Hill, then they get Kenta Maeda. They gave up Bruce Dark Gratterall, a top 100 prospect, to get him, but they went out and got a, a veteran pitcher to help these this rotation. I mean, the rotation just needed the most help. They also go out and sign Josh Donaldson. We'll get into that in a second. But the rotation now boasts a really young guy, 26 in May. In a couple months, will be Jose Barrios. He'll be 26, so he's really young still. Very, very good pitcher. He ended up with 200 innings last year, which is good to see. So he's going to continue to build upon that, right? He's 25 right now. That innings, if he can be consistently 200, you feel really good because he has really good stuff. He had 195 strikeouts, so he was just under 200. That's going to want to improve. He had a 3.68 ERA, which is solid. That's going to improve as well. Uh, game one of the division series against the Yankees, he wasn't bad. He only threw four innings, though. So he went four innings. He gave up three runs, but only one of them was an earned run. And he gave up six, walk six Ks and three walks. So it wasn't a bad outing. They just kind of pulled him early because it's the way the kind of the game rolled. In the postseason, they're a little bit quicker hook for starting pitchers. He gets that bullpen a little bit faster. It's kind of a, a sprint, right? As opposed to the regular season, it's supposed to be a marathon. Postseason is a sprint. And so you guys get less outings. So it wasn't a bad outing from Barrios. And it gives him a first outing in the postseason, something for him to build upon. The next guy up would be Jake Odorizzi. He came over from Tampa Bay a few years ago. And he did decent for him last year. You want to see more innings out of him, 159, but that's kind of because of injuries. 
But in those 159 innings, he had 178 strikeouts, which is an encouraging sign, right? That you want to see if a guy has more strikeouts than he has innings, it means he's got stuff. It means right, the stuff is there. So he had a 3 5 1 ERA. He had a 1 2 1 whip, really good. Game three started for them, and he also had a decent outing. He went five innings, he gave up two runs, uh, five Ks, and gave up one home run. So, so you have the, your guys, right? The, you're going to be your one two, even with Maida and Homer Bailey added to the fold. Your one two guys were bad in that division series. They just your bullpen and your offense couldn't get going, right? And then your game two starter, uh, Dubnik, he, he's going to be a guy that might eat up some innings for them this year. Uh, he kind of was a guy that wasn't supposed to make the majors. He just kind of was a fill-in guy because uh, the guy they were supposed to have, Joel Chassin, wasn't there. He was he was healthy. They had the other guy. Um, oh man, I cannot think of his name right now. Uh, Michael Pineda. He was <laughs> uh, he was supposed to be their number three guy. And he's another guy that has really really good stuff, but just can't stay can't stay in the field, man. He's always in trouble, and he was suspended last year. It was a big blow to that rotation. Uh, so they leaned heavily on Odorizzi and Berrios. They did okay. Uh, they're young though, and they will continue to get better. Kante Maida is added to this fold. He only threw 153 innings last year as well. Part of that is because Dodgers' depth. Every time a pitcher gets like a little bit of a nick or a bruise or something, they're able to kind of let him rest. They cut out their innings a little bit. And then they move him to the bullpen in September and October. And he's really good in that position. But that's also why he wanted to leave. He was tired of being moved to the bullpen, even though he was just dominant there. He wanted to be a full-time starter. He wanted to be a starter. And this is his chance in Minnesota to do so. Still... In the bullpen last year in the postseason, and this is why the, the Twins are really intrigued by having him, uh, against Washington, he went four and two-thirds innings. He only gave a, a hit, only one run, and seven Ks. He finished with a, a 0 0.21 whip. Actually, I'm sorry, he gave up no runs. So no runs, no walks, nothing. Just one hit. One hit and four and two-thirds innings and seven Ks. Just dominant. Because his stuff is just nasty. When his breaking ball, as someone who's watched him for a few years now, right, came into the league in 2016, uh, his breaking ball is, is hitting. He's hitting that strike zone or he's getting that call with his slider and his curveball. He's, he's unhittable. He's, he's untouchable. He's very, very, very good when that thing is hitting and it's hitting his spots. If he's off even a little bit, I've seen a game and I, I can always tell what kind of outing he's going to have based on like the first couple batters. So if he's getting that call on the edge with his breaking ball or if he's right, I mean, it just this much that's the difference in a lot of games for these pitchers if they're they're missing by this much and he was missing early and he wasn't correcting it after the first batter or two I knew it was going to be a long outing for him and it usually was uh if he was though if he was getting those calls early if he was <laughs> right hitting the spot early he was going to be really good and that's the way it kind of rolls for Kenta Maeda and that's why he has a 404 whip or ERA which isn't terrible which is pretty good though Right, especially when you have a 1.07 whip. So he has a higher level whip. He doesn't give up a lot of hits, doesn't give up a lot of walks. But if he's hitting his spot, really, really good. And there that's why they're really intrigued by having Kenta Maeda there. Homer Bailey is a veteran guy that they brought in to eat up innings, right? Kind of what the A's do, kind of what the Rays do, kind of what the Yankees are gonna have to do. They bring in Homer Bailey, a veteran guy. He had 163 innings last year. He had a four five seven ERA. Uh, he didn't have a whole lot of strikeouts. His whip was a little bit higher, but he ate up innings, and that's what the Twins want, right? And then go into the season, if they get Pineda back, right, if he ever stays on the field, and they go with Berrios, Odorizzi, Maeda, and then they can go Pineda maybe, or Joel Chassin if he bounces back in 2019. He didn't have a uh, great, or 2020, he didn't have a great 2019 after having a really, really good 2018 in Milwaukee, and part of that was just injuries. If he gets healthy, and you can have just Homer Bailey be an innings eater guy, and then maybe move to the pen in uh, the postseason, you're feeling really good. You're feeling at least a lot, lot better than you did in 2019 as far as your pitching goes. And that will also help out the bullpen. And the bullpen is led by Taylor Rogers, their closer, who's really good, but the rest of the bullpen wasn't as good. But what does Taylor Rogers do in his second kind of year as the guy? He had 30 saves in 2019. He had a 2.61 ERA, which is a little bit higher for a closer, but not terrible, obviously. Uh, the best part about it is he had a 100 whip, so he didn't give a whole lot. He, one hit or one walk per innings he pitched, and he pitched a lot of innings. 69 innings for a closer is really good. He had 90 strikeouts in those innings. So those numbers are really encouraging to help this rotation move along. Uh, the team as a total, they finished 8th in the ERA, 9th in whip, 12th in strikeouts, and 20th in walks. I mean, in batting average against. So, again, that was the, that was the position of need. They went out and addressed that this offseason. The offensive side of things is where they are winning all those games. I mean, part of it is, so the American League side, you're going to see higher records than you're going to see in the NL side when we do that in episode uh, 6, right, or 5. There, there's more wins this side because it's so top-heavy, 
right? So a lot of these numbers, you got to take them as we go over both leagues. You got to take them with a grain of salt because the American League has six, maybe seven, if you had Boston in the right. So Cleveland, Boston, outside of the playoff teams that are good. The rest of them are not good at all. Like the White Sox improved. They're trying to get better in this next year. The Angels improved to get better in the next year. Um, Toronto's improved, trying to get better this next year. But in 2019, those teams were bad, really, really bad. Where in the American League and the National League, there was you're going like eight, nine teams trying to fight for a playoff spot that year. So you didn't have as many wins. So that that adjusts and that you got to take that into account when you're thinking of the National League compared to the American League. Still, Twins were really good offensively. Max Kepler, the right fielder, really good. 36 home runs, 90 RBIs, 855 OPS. Jorge Polanco, 26-year-old shortstop. Had a lot of at-bats, 631 at-bats. And I didn't mention this in the Simeon, uh, Marcus Simeon for the A's. He also is a durable shortstop. He was the only of five players to play in every single game in uh, 2019. And Jorge Polanco was right there. He, I think he only missed a couple games. He had 22 home runs. He had 295 average and 841 OPS. Really good young shortstop, especially defensively. Nelson Cruz is the DH I was talking about. And I talked about Chris Davis being pretty good. Nelson Cruz is like top five in like all offensive categories in 2019. He just doesn't play defense, so he's not a part of the MVP count. But man, the dude just rakes. He's going to be 40 this year in July. And at 39, he hit 311, 41 home runs, 108 RBIs on a 1.031 wit or OPS. The guy was just raking last year, just hitting everything in sight. And uh, he's going to continue to do so, especially now behind him in that run roster. He's got even more of a cushion and a bit of a buffer, right? If you have a better hitter behind you, more likely you're going to see more pitches, right? Because they're not going to want to pitch around you. They're going to see more pitches because they don't want to see the guy behind you. And when the guy behind you is the rainmaker, Josh Donaldson, and as I mentioned, the Twins, they wanted to prove that they were here for real, that they were not just a one-year, one hundred-win team. They want to continue to win. They want to continue to improve. What do you do? How do you do that? You go out there and spend some money. They get Josh Donaldson on a four-year deal, and there he is, hitting 259, 37 home runs, 94 RBIs, 900 OPS. That's man. That's nice to have. It's nice to have behind again Polanco, Cruz, Kepler. That one through four is really good. Behind him is no slouch either, and Eddie Rosario. Rosario hit 32 home runs and had 109 RBIs and an 800 OPS. Behind him was catcher Mitch Garver. He didn't have as many at bats, 311 at bats. It's kind of why they brought in Alex Avila to kind of help him out. But in his at bats, Manny made him worth it. 31 home runs in that time, 995 OPS. Really, really good. Luis Arise. Really good second baseman, right? He's not going to give you a lot as far as uh, the pop goes. Not a lot of power, but he did hit 334 in uh, his time in, up there. And again, with the power around him, he doesn't need to have the power. You get on base, you're turning your solo home runs into two-run home runs and the three-run home runs, and that goes a long ways. Man, if you have a team just hitting solo jacks, you can live with that as a pitcher. But if they're hitting two, three home run, three-run home runs or a grand slam, that's a lot harder to swallow. And if you have a guy that gets on base, that can change that into it. Especially behind him, Miguel Sano kind of helped to flip the roster over. He hit 37 or 34 home runs at a 9.23 OPS. And Sano has been there for a little bit. He's a younger guy that they want to continue to develop and grow. And uh, he did develop and grow this year. He still needs to be a bit better defensively. Uh, having Donaldson there helps out a lot. He can move over to first base permanently and do a little bit more there. You need to see that average go up. But hopefully you see that you're very encouraged by the power numbers that he put up in 2019. Byron Buxton, another young guy that they were hoping to build on, right? It was Barrio Sano, Buxton. Buxton plays very top-notch defense, right? He's up there as far as defensive center fielders go. He's very fast, but his offensive numbers aren't there. He's going to want to improve upon that as he goes on. Marvin Gonzalez is another outfielder that's going to kind of be utility-type outfielder who's going to cover all the positions and, and help that outfield grow. Uh, he was with that the Astros team right in 2017, 2018, come over last year to help the Twins kind of develop and move on. He had 15 home runs last year. He was hurt a little bit, so uh, he's going to slide into the fold. And if Buxton's not playing well, he will fit into that center field role. Team as a total, because they rake, <laughs> they finished second in average in all Major League Baseball. They finished first in home runs in all Major League Baseball, first in RBIs, second in OPS. They didn't strike out a whole lot. They were 25th. And they didn't walk a whole lot. So they just hit for a lot of power. <laughs> they got on base and they hit for a lot of power. Let's see if they continue to do so. Uh, adding Josh Donaldson is only going to help that case. They're managed by Rocco Baldelli, who was the manager of the year in 2019. And Rocco Baldelli has turned out to be a great hire by the Twins. Uh, really, really good. Their GM and senior VP is Thad Levine. And he's been there since 2016. Uh, he's 48 years old, a younger type GM, which you'll see is, is kind of a common theme for some of these teams. 
Um, but he doing a good job, man. He's been there since 2016, and that's kind of when they started to turn the tide a little bit, right? You're coming out of the, the Joe Maurer, um, Morneau days. You were wanting to move in to a new type era. Uh, Thad Levine's done a really good job in helping them do so. As you see, this team is, is really good. Their 17th ranked payroll, 132 million. The league average again is 138. So they're just barely above league average. So they could, they could theoretically go out there and get another player. Especially when you consider they have the seventh ranked farm system. They have four top 100 prospects. So they have prospects to go out there and get a frontline starter. What happens in the National League East? That's the, that's the league to look at because you have the Marlins who are young but have really good pitching. Maybe they want to make a move. You have the Nationals who I don't think they repeat. We'll get into that in episode five. I, I don't think they're going to repeat. They have some really good pitchers. Maybe Patrick Corbin becomes available. The, the Mets, what do they do? Marcus Stroman's going to be a free agent next year. If they're struggling, do they move on from Marcus Stroman, give him a one-year rental to the Twins? Be a great fit. What do they do with Syndergaard? I mean, he's not going to pitch this year, but uh, maybe next year. Probably less likely for him. Probably less likely for DeGrom. But Marcus Stroman, Steve Matz, those two guys could be 100% available if they start fading in that division. What about the Phillies? Jake Arrieta, does he become available? He's a kind of a veteran guy. Aaron Nola, if he doesn't kind of bounce back right away for the Philly and they kind of struggle a little bit, maybe he becomes available. I think the NL East is going to be the, the league to look at because it's the deepest league and there's a lot of pitching to look there. Twins might make a move with one of those teams. Uh, 2020, depending on how the year kind of goes. They also have the number nine overall prospect, shortstop Royce Lewis. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with him because they do have a young shortstop who's really good already in uh, Jorge Polanco. So what do they do? They move him to second base, move him to third base. Do they move Polanco to second or third? Uh, do they maybe use Royce to get a top line starter, just get that much more out there to get uh, an elite guy instead of a guy that's towards the end of his contract or a guy that's kind of struggling? Um, going to be interesting to see what they do there, but they do have some room to move. Let's move on from the Twins. We're moving on to the Tampa Bay Rays. Tampa Bay Rays finished with the third, <laughs> with the, the worst record in the American League side, but I have them third here because when they got in the playoffs, right, they beat the A's, and then they did a lot better than the Twins did in the playoffs, and that's the, the reason I did that. I didn't go off record on this one. I went on how teams did. So they beat the A's in the wildcard game 5-1, to one, right, in Oakland, and then they took the Astros to the brink. They lost 6-2 and 3-1 the first two games in Houston, and then they go back to Tampa and they win 10 to three and four to one to make it a series before Garrett Cole just kind of shuts the door and says enough is enough in game five. And <laughs> Houston moves on, but they did have some fight. And you're gonna see that offensively, they weren't very good this year, but they're gonna get better. And this is a team, again, like the A's to look out for that they're gonna continue to improve as long as right injuries and developments continue to happen. This off season, they were a little bit more active than the A's, still not like completely active, but they went out and made some moves. So on December 6th, they traded away Tommy Pham. And Tommy Pham was one of their better players, and he's a solid player. They traded him to San Diego, and they get Hunter Renfro. Hunter Renfro has a little bit more power than Tommy Pham, and he plays better defense. But Tommy Pham was a little bit more of a complete player. Uh, so the, the Padres also gave up a couple prospects in that trade to go with Renfro. But the, the Rays are looking to get defense behind this elite-level pitching that they got going on now. So that's where they go out and get Hunter Renfro. Tommy Pham's a little bit older. They get a little bit younger in this trade. And they go out and sign Japanese first baseman Yoshitomo Tsutsugo. He's 28 years old. He's supposed to be like an on-base type machine, uh, similar to the guy that the Reds picked up. We talked about him a little bit. Uh, he, it's going to be interesting to see where he fits in because they, this lineup does have people like in place but none of them are like blowing you away. So he's definitely gonna get an opportunity to prove that he can bring something to the table for this team. Uh, January 9th, they traded uh, Matt, Le uh, Matt Libertor. He was uh, their top prospect and they got Cards Jose Martinez and the Cardinals top prospect in Randy Orozarena. So that was kind of a prospect flipped and then getting a veteran type uh, guy in Jose Martinez to be a utility guy. Uh, Libertor is obviously the better prospect in the two, so that's why the Cardinals had to give up two, two guys. They also traded away Emilio Pagan on February 8th, another top prospect for them. And they got Manu Margot and then a prospect in Logan Driscoll. So they gave away two top prospects for more major league type, ready type guys now. And the Padres are stacked as far as their minor league goes and the Rays are stacked as far as their, their minor leagues go. And that's why they're able to kind of make these trades and that's why they work together in this trade. Uh, uh, Margot, again, elite defensive type guy, doesn't bring much of the dish, but he will kind of fit in and help them out as far as being a utility type outfielder. Same with Jose Martinez, be a utility type infielder, uh, good defensively, not much at the plate. This rotation, why are they building up this defensive right? 
Jose Martinez, Manuel Margot, Hunter Renfro. Why are they bringing these defensive guys in? Well, this rotation is really, really good, and it's really young. They're led by Blake Snell, who's a younger guy. I think he's 28. Uh, he didn't have a great 2019, but that, part of that was because he was hurt. But he still ended up with 147 strikeouts, 107 innings, which is an encouraging sign. And then when they got into the playoffs, he was really good for them. He pitched in three games. He had one of those games was a start. He had a 1690 array. He got five and a third innings. He had seven Ks in those five innings. He had a 0 0.75 whip. Again, all encouraging. His only game start was in the division series against the Yankees. Uh, I mean, against the, the Astros, and it was game two. He went three innings, four hits, only gave up one run on a home run and five Ks. Again, the postseason, you're more likely to get a hook quick. But in 2018, he was, the, he was not only was he really, really good, he was the Cy Young Award winner in the American League. So he was the best pitcher in the American League in 2018, and he was healthy then. And he got healthy towards the end of the year, so I can imagine that 2020 should be a better year, barring any sort of, any sort of right, injuries. If he's not hurting, he's going to be really good again in 2020. And then you add to the fact that behind him, he's got a guy in Tyler Glass now. Tyler Glass now only threw six innings last year because he was a younger guy. Similar to right what happened with the, um, the Luciano and um, Montes in Oakland, right, younger guys, they want to stretch them out so they give them less innings their first couple years and they start going more and more innings. Glasnow is probably going to get a lot more innings in 2020 if they start playing in 2021, definitely more innings. He had a 1.78 yeah, rate in those 20, 60 innings. He also had 76 strikeouts and a 0 0.89 whip because the guy is just nasty. And he was part of that trade, uh, Chris Archer to the Pirates. Him and uh, one of the offensive guys we'll get into here in a second. It was... Um, Austin Meadows, <laughs> and you'll see the numbers Austin Meadows put up. You already saw Tyler Glass now. Man, it was a rough trade for the Pirates. And I covered that a little bit more when I covered the Pirates. Uh, I don't remember what episode that was in. I think it was like episode 11 or 12, somewhere in there. Um, but Tyler Glass now really good. In the division series, he pitched in two games. He pitched game one. He went four and a third innings. He gave up two runs, four hits, uh, five strikeouts, three walks. So again, he had a quick hook, but it wasn't terrible. Uh, game five, he wasn't as good. Two and two thirds, five, four runs, five hits, three Ks. Uh, but again, young guy. And same with Oakland, right? Same with Minnesota. They got innings under their belts. They got postseason experience, and that's something to build upon. Now, not a lot of guys just jump into the postseason and are dominant, right? Uh, mad bums don't just fall off trees. But getting them innings and getting them that exposure, like, hey, I can do this. I can, right? He went and got some strikeouts. Blake Snow went and got some strikeouts. Those guys went and got some outs in the postseason. Yo, I can do this, right? Big for them. Charlie Morton is their veteran guy, and he was their, their ace last year, and he was in Cy Young contention this year in 2019. He came over from Houston. It was really good for them. Again, he's a little bit older, but he was just really good. 305 ERA, great. 194 innings pitched, good. 240 strikeouts, really, really good. Uh, the uh, 1.08 whip, again, really good. Even Charlie Morton, it's a, very understated, and, and I don't know if it's appreciated enough how well he did and what he did for this Tampa team and just how good he was. And the postseason, he pitched in that wild card game. He got a win, five innings, no runs, one hit, three walks, four Ks, but good. Uh, game three, division series against Houston, five innings, three hits, only one run on a home run, nine Ks, two walks. So he was really good in the offseason, really good in the regular, in the postseason. He's only going to help those guys, Snell and Glass now, continue to develop. And if he's their number three, ah, I think every team in the league would take a number three like Charlie Morton. So one through three, they're really good. After that, Yoni Chirinos, which is going to happen with most teams, four and five aren't going to be as good. But these are young guys with really good stuff. So they have Yoni Chirinos, who at, was really good at times, threw in 133 innings. I see the innings go up, but you're, you're happy with that. 105 uh, whip is encouraging. Strikeout numbers are a little bit low, but that's okay. His whip's low. He's going to give you innings. You're happy with that as number four. Number five is uh, Ryan Yarbrough. And he threw in 140 innings. He had a 100 whip last year. Again, you'll take that. A strikeout is a little bit low again, but those aren't your dominant type guys. When you have Snell, Glass, Snell, Morton as your dominant type guys on the bottom, at the top, you want your bottom guys to just eat up innings and be solid in those innings. Give your team a chance to be in those games. And that's exactly what Chirinos and Yarbrough do. Yarbrough threw in the postseason. He threw in three games. He threw three innings, all a relief, right? He gave up a hit, a walk, zero runs. He had a 100 whip again in the regular season as he did in the postseason. So uh, just solid fours and fives. This rotation is really good. All right, and they have a couple guys coming up that are also really good. Uh, their bullpen is decent as well, which helped this team total stats go. They were number two in ERA, number three in strikeouts, number three in whip, and number three in batting average against. It was basically the Rays, the Dodgers, and the Astros, and then everybody else. 
That's how elite they are. The offensive side of things is a little bit different. So Minnesota was really good offensively, not as good in the po pitching side. It's the opposite for the Rays. But a big part of that was because they were young and because they were dealing with injuries. And so they were let off by Mike Zanino, right? There's their catcher. They got to get more in their catching position. They just He didn't really do anything for them last year. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do there because offensively, Zanino was, was terrible. I'm, it's not even worth reading the numbers. <laughs> he was just he was bad. He was good defensively, good with the staff, not good at the plate. G-Man Choi is at first base, and him and uh, Yoshitomo Tutsugo, they're probably going to bounce back and forth between first base and DH. Them and like Emmanuel Margot. So we're going to see how they kind of rotate those things. He ended up with 19 home runs, and uh, but only 63 RBIs and 822 OPS. Decent, but nothing blows you away. Jose Martinez is the utility guy that's coming in for the Cardinals. He doesn't bring you much to the plate, but he does bring you decent defense, as I mentioned. He did manage to hit 10 home runs last year, but ah, got to get more. Brandon Lau, a young second baseman. He's going to get more opportunity. He's going to continue to grow. He's going to be a big part of this offense, taking a step forward in 2020, which I fully expect to do so. He had 270 last year, 17 home runs, 51 RBIs, 850 OPS. And he didn't have as many at-bats, right? He was a younger guy, just kind of building up the strength and that um, uh, experience as he moves forward. Willem Adames, similar thing as a shortstop, although he's, his position is... We'll see what happens with him. <laughs> he did end up hitting 20 home runs, though, but his OPS at 735 leaves a lot to be desired. Decent glove, but again, I will get into it in a second. He's, he's the one that should be kind of sweating a little bit for his job uh, to stay in Tampa. Uh, Yandy Diaz, this guy, I'm not going to read his regular season numbers as they weren't great, but a big part of that was because he was hurt a huge chunk of the season. Right, He only had 14 home runs, but it wasn't because he doesn't have the pop or the offensive talent. He really does. And if you want to know why, go back and watch the postseason from last year. Watch those race games. Who's leading the charge? Yandy Diaz. He had two home runs in that set in the wild card game alone. He's a very, very good third baseman, uh, young guy who's going to start gaining a lot more attention, especially if he can stay healthy. Austin Meadows is a guy that we talked about. He was in that trade with Tyler Glasnow for Chris Archer. You want to know what he did? We saw what Glasnow did. He hit 291, 33 home runs, 89 RBIs, and a 922 OPS as a young right fielder. Played good defense. He's just going to keep building, right? Him, Brandon Lau, Yandy Diaz, and uh, a guy we'll get into here in a second. They're going to help. That, that Those four in that lineup automatically makes that lineup respectable. And they're young, and they're going to continue to develop. Kevin Kiermaier is also there, but he doesn't bring you much to the plate. But he does bring you an elite defensive glove. He's similar to like Hunter Renfro and Manuel Margot. So Kiermaier, Renfro, Margot. Kiermaier hit 14 home runs. Renfro hit 33 home runs, which just brings you the most pop out of those guys. Margot hit 12 home runs. But their averages go as this, 228 for Kiermaier, 216 for Renfro, and 234 for Margot. You want to look at the OPS side of it? 676 for Kiermaier, 778 for Renfro, 691 for Margot. A little bit of pop, but not much in there. But they're really, really, really good defensively. Kiermaier won the gold glove that, the, this last year. He also won in 15-16. And in 17-18, the only reason he kind of didn't win one or was like runner-up for them is because he was hurt those two years. But they got to bring you more. So you have Meadows, who is holding down the outfield as far as the offense goes. But you got to get more, man. The, the infield, so uh, third, short, second, and first, good offensively. Right field, good offensively. But the catcher's terrible. And your center and right fielder are terrible. So those guys got to step up a little bit more offensively. Uh, but I do expect this offense to be better than their numbers were in 2019. So they finished 12th in average, 20th in home run, 18 in RBIs, 13 OBS, 9 in strikeouts. None of those are good. Right, especially what well, made for a playoff team. You you don't see those for a playoff team, but again, they were young. They're gonna get better, and a big part of them getting better, as I mentioned, they have the number one ranked farm system in all of baseball. They jumped the Padres, and these rankings are from MLB.com, and they were done on March 9th, so they were the most uh, uh, the most recent updates for the farm system. And the Padres again, they got they jumped the Padres, and they are led by shortstop Wander Franco. He's the number one overall prospect in all of baseball. People are comparing him to Mike Trout level prospect. That's a that's man, that's heady. Mike Trout is the best player to ever play the game. And so if you're getting even a little bit of comparisons to him, and, it, and it's not just a couple people comparing him to, that means a lot, right? And, and as I mentioned, Willie Adam, Will Adamaeus, he's got to be sweating his spot right now because you put in Franco in that spot. And that offense it jumps up automatically. But he's going to be a rookie this year if he does play, which I expect him. Actually, I, I do. I don't imagine how they're going to keep him out of the majors for too much longer, just how good he is. So 
He's going to be up there pretty soon. Adam has got to be sweating a little bit. They also have six other top 100 prospects. Uh, and in those six, they have the number 15 overall prospect to go with the number one overall prospect. And this is Brendan McKay. And he's interesting because he's going to be up there this year. He is both a DH and a left-handed pitcher. He is really similar to Shohei Otani. May not play the elite type defense that Shohei Otani plays in right, but he can hit for you and pitch. So, uh, two-way player, uh, very interesting to see what they do there. Their offense, again, should, with that, with Brandon McKay, without, with uh, Franco, it's going to continue to improve. Those numbers aren't going to be as bad. And if you consider that that rotation is still young and still getting better, that uh, raise... Uh, I'm, I would, if I was a Yankees fan, if I was going to be nervous about any team... It's going to be Tampa Bay Rays. That team is really good. <laughs> and they're going to continue to get better. Uh, they have the 27th ranked payroll at 59. And they are similar to the A's in the sense where they keep a payroll low. Part of it is because they don't have great facilities and great fan um, showing up and ownership. And that's going to change for both those because the stadiums are, they're going to get new stadiums. They're going to end up with different locations. They're going to end up doing something different. The talks right now with the Rays is they're going to play half their home games in Tampa, half their home games in Montreal. And those are what, that's what they're trying to do right now. I don't like it. Most of baseball doesn't like it. So I don't know if that's going to get approved or not. So they may look at maybe just moving to a new stadium in Tampa because they're right there in St. Petersburg right now. Maybe they move closer to Tampa, uh, maybe around the area that the, the Yankee Spring Training Facility is at. Maybe they move in, in more toward Orlando. Maybe they move up. Maybe they go to Tennessee, like Nashville area. Maybe they go to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Those are all viable options. Or maybe they just go permanently to Montreal. If those things happen, they probably end up with new ownership. And if they add to this payroll, 59 million is super low. <laughs> right? 130 is the league average. That's the median for the league. They're at 59. So if they get new ownership, they start spending more money. How good this team is now, look out if they spend money. Uh, Kevin Cash is their manager, and he's been their manager since 2015. Um, he's last played catcher in 2010. So he it was five years after he retired from the league that he became a manager. He's only 42 years old, but he's highly respected. Um, the, he's he's going to continue to grow. He does a great job managing this team. Eric Neander is their new GM, and he's just a another executive in a long line of just elite-level executives coming from the Andrew Friedman branch. We're going to talk about another guy that came from this uh, in this episode right the the red sox their new gm is from the rays the yankees the dodgers obviously have andrew friedman who's from the rays and they just pump out elite level executives it just it becomes a little bit unfair at times uh, but that's what they do well man they have executives and they spend low and they keep them prospects really good so look out for the Rays. as i mentioned we're gonna skip the juicy gems for the youtube version uh this episode already went really long for the podcast version and i'm trying to keep it down for the youtube version uh, probably not not working, but now uh, here we are. Let's move on to the Yankees, and that's what the hat is for the Yankees. I like it a lot of. <laughs> I people give me a hard time. I've always been a Dodger fan, long time Dodger fan, uh, but I wear different hats because I just I love baseball in general. I pay attention to all teams. I don't pay just pay attention to the Dodgers, and I think that's kind of what leads me to do well at this. Is that I even though I have a favorite team, I'm I don't favor them. I'm realistic about things, and there is a, a lot that I like on every different team. Like, I really like the Rays. I've always liked the Rays. I really like the A's. Um, I, just, I can find a storyline and a player on every single team that I like and that I've watched. Uh, even the Giants and the Diamondbacks, even though it kills me at times. But <laughs> uh, I do own a lot of different hats because I love baseball in general. So we're in the Yankees hat because we're going Yankees. This is the Chicken Nuggets. This was my little girl's uh, softball team for her first year softball last year, T-ball. We coached them. They wanted me to pick the name. I went with Chicken Nuggets. They came out with this design. I liked it a lot. So I'm going to rep the Chicken Nuggets today for, <laughs> for all, all the little ones that I coached last year. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but let's talk about the Yankees. In the podcast version, I went at length about the Yankees. I tried to cut it down. It was hard to. I'm going to try to cut it down here. If you want more Yankee content, I do cover a lot more in the podcast version. Uh, but let's get into this. They swept the Twins, as we talked about. They lost to the, the Houston Astros, though, in the ALCS 4-2. to two. They won game one behind um, uh, Masahiro Tanaka, <laughs> seven nothing. But then they lost games three or two, three and four, three two, four and one, and eight three. They won game five in New York, four to one, and then they lost game six, six four in Houston. Uh, their offseason acquisitions, they needed help, and the pitching staff, pitching side of ball uh, side of things. So what do they do? They go out and get arguably the best pitcher in all of baseball. Right for me is between him and Jacob Degrom. Like if I had to pick a play pitcher to start a team with right now, and I'm looking to win right now, it'd be either Garrett Cole or Jacob Degrom. 
if I ended up with like a guy like Jack Flaherty or, or Walker Bueller or, you know what I mean? I, I wouldn't be upset. <laughs> but those are probably the first two picks would be DeGrom and Garrett Cole. They signed him to a nine-year mega deal. They also go out and get Nick Tropiano and Chad Bettis. They signed them to minor league deals. And the reason they did that is as you'll see they have some injuries to deal with. They got a little bit older pitching and you need these guys. As I mentioned, the minor league deals are a little bit more than minor league deals at time. And you sign these guys to eat innings. You need veteran pitchers. I, I don't care how good young pitchers you have. I don't care if you feel like you have three through four locked down solid. You need to have veteran arms because they're going to get nicked up over the length of a season. 162 games is a long time. And if they're not 100% right, you want to let them rest so that when it comes to September, right, August, September, October, you want them to be healthy. So you bring in these older guys, Tropiano, Chad Bettis with major league experience that can go out there and get you outs. That's where they go and sign these things. So they bring in really three pitchers to help them get through the 2020 season. They also bring in Chris Ayaneta to give Gary Sanchez a little bit of a spell. He's a little bit better defensively, Ayaneta is. Uh, so they bring him on a minor league deal. Uh, they did, however, lose some people. So they lost D.D. Gregorius, which he was hurt all of 2019, and Gleber Torres is becoming a, just a superstar, just a stud shortstop for them, which everyone kind of figured would be the case anyways. Uh, so, But he's a veteran guy in that, that clubhouse and on that roster. So he is he will be missed. Edwin Encarnacion is probably be their, their DH type guy, a, just a power hitter, one of the better DHs in the league. He's gone. Dylan Mantansis, who meant a lot to the bullpen, and we'll get into that in a second. He's gone. CC Zabathia retired. He didn't do much for you in 2019, but hats off to CC Zabathia. I've always had a lot of respect for him. He had a great career. Hope you enjoy your retirement. And then Cameron Mabrin, a defensive kind of just filling outfielder. But they're they're kind of stacked at outfield. So those ones don't matter as much as like uh, Encarnacion and Pantanz is probably the two biggest hits for them in 2020 moving forward. This rotation is led by Garrett Cole, as we mentioned, one of the best pitchers in baseball. He had a 2.50 ERA last year. He threw in 212 innings. And in those 212 innings, which is already high, he had 326 strikeouts. That is insane. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. 300 and 300 3 326 strikeouts in 212 innings that's i mean again it's just, those numbers I've, I've listed a lot of numbers in the past this those you guys should at least know by now that that's uh that's not normal and to add to it he had a 0 0.89 whip so nobody gets on base and he strikes out everybody in sight Guy's just nasty. He was nasty when he was in UCLA. He was nasty in Pittsburgh, even though he floundered a bit. And then he was nastier when he got to Houston. He pitched in the postseason a lot. Pitched in five games. I feel like he probably should have pitched game seven. Right? I mean, I won't get into it. He should have came in to relieve in game seven when we get to the Astro side of it. Threw a game two against Tampa. That was his first game of the postseason. He went seven and two thirds, four hits, no runs, 15 strikeouts, and a walk. Got the win. Game five against Tampa, right? As I mentioned, he came in and kind of ended that series as Tampa tried to make it a little bit elongated. Eight innings, two hits, only one run on a home run, 10 strikeouts, two walks. Nasty got the win again. CS comes along, championship series against the Yankees. Game uh, game three, seven innings, four hits, no runs, seven Ks, five walks, got the win. Game one of the World Series against the Nationals. Seven innings, eight, hit, eight hits, five runs, six Ks, two home runs, it was his worst outing of the postseason. Still ended up going seven innings, but got the loss. Turns around in game five. Things are a little bit different, right? You don't you don't get Garrett Cole twice. He goes seven innings, three hits, only one run on a home run, nine punches, two walks. Got the win. So his total for the postseason, he was four and one with a one seven two ERA. He threw in 36 innings, had 47 strikeouts, had a 0 0.87 whip and 11 walks. He just did the same thing he did during the regular season. He struck out a lot of people and didn't let anybody get on base. Didn't give up a whole lot of runs. So Garrett Cole, just nasty. Again, I think he should have probably came in in game seven. The Astros may have won. Solidified that dynasty right of winning two out of three. Anyways, James Paxson is the next guy on the list. He's hurt. He was going to be hurt to start the year. But because of the delay in the season, the Yankees are probably the one that benefits the most. One of the teams that benefit the most. And that they can get healthy. James Paxson, they say, is healthy. Uh, so he should be there towards the beginning of the season. He had a 3.82 ERA last year. He only threw in 150 innings because he's he just has been a, a career of not getting as many innings as he should with the talent he has. 186 strikeouts in those 150 innings. But if he can finally get a year where he gets 200 innings, you feel really, really good because the stuff is there. The stuff has always been there. In the postseason, he goes game one against the Minnesota Twins. He gets a no decision. Only throws in four or two-thirds innings. Uh, gives it three runs and two home runs, but he has eight Ks and a walk. So it's a solid outing. You get quick hook in the postseason, as we talked about. 
Game two against Houston gets a no decision, only throws in two in the third inning, although he only gives up a run. Again, depending on what the postseason dictates, it's hard to, to gauge these numbers unless you're like a uh, like a DeGrom or a Cole or a Kershaw, uh, Jack Flaherty, those type guys, you get a little bit more leash. Everybody else, if you're not just a consistently a stud, you're going to have a quicker quicker hook in the postseason. It's just the reality of it. Game five against Houston was his best outing in the postseason. He goes six innings. He's a run, nine Ks, four walks. He gets a big-time win in game five, sends him to game six, kind of extends the series, gives the Yankees a little bit more life before the Astros win that game and go on to the World Series. Uh, Masahiro Tanaka is the other guy. So during the regular season, he's not going to do a lot for you, but he's a solid number three, number four if they have Montgomery healthy or if Severino is there. He's out. Severino obviously is out with Tommy John. He would be their number two. They're kind of co-ace there. Uh, but he's out for 2020 and uh, maybe the beginning of 2021. We'll see how it kind of develops and how his rehab goes back from Tommy John. Um, he Again, regular season, 182 innings for Tanaka. You like it. His ERA and, and, and strikeouts were... were Higher ERA, lower uh, strikeout totals. But I mean, he's just a veteran guy's going to eat up innings for you. Game two against Minnesota. This is what he does in the postseason. This is why you like Tanaka the most is because in the postseason, he's just a different pitcher. He's just really good. He's better in the postseason than he is in the regular season. That's the reality of it. Game two against Minnesota, five innings, one run, seven Ks, and a walk. Gets the W. Game one against Houston, six innings, no runs, a hit, four Ks, and a walk. W. Game four against Houston, five innings, Four runs, three earned runs, and a home run, a K, two walks, is only loss. <laughs> but he is, I mean, again, five innings, six innings, five innings. You you love that. You love that from your number three, number four guy in the postseason. Jay Happ's going to be another guy that's there. Uh, he's just going to be there to kind of eat up in. He's going to be like Trapiano. He's going to be like Bettis. You just need a guy that's going to eat in a bit so you don't wear out that bullpen. You don't wear out the rest of your starters. Uh, he, he threw in 161 innings, so you're, that's good. And you'll take that again in 2020. Uh, he pitched in three relief games during the postseason, and he was decent there. He had a 2 4 5 ERA, three two thirds innings. If he does make the postseason roster, that's probably where he's going to be at again is in the bullpen. Jordan Montgomery had Tommy John surgery last March 23rd. He was a highly regarded prospect, and he is really, really well thought of. Before he had that Tommy John surgery, what does he look like? Does he need to be stretched out? Is he going to be able to give you the innings? Is he going to be healthy by the time postseason comes around? Because if he's healthy and throwing his good stuff, he alleviates a lot of the, the stresses that you have coming into the season, thinking about what does Paxton give you as far as his health, what does Tanaka give you as far as his age, what does Hap give you, what does Trapiano, right? Because you know what Cole's going to give you. What does everyone else give you? The bullpen. Okay, so for a long time, people, Yankees fans and, and baseball say, yeah, we don't even, we're not worried about the rotation because the offense is going to hit and that that bullpen is just so lights out, it's going to alleviate a lot of pressure. I hate to break it to you, the bullpen finished ninth in ERA last year in 20, 2019. It's just not not elite. It's just not elite. I'm sorry. They had a 408 ERA. That's not elite. It's not. They have elite level arms as far as stuff goes. Those numbers are not elite. I I, I don't know what else. You know what I mean? That's you have still have questions as far as that goes, but you have the stuff there. Matt Chapman or is that, uh, not Matt Chapman? Roll this Chapman. Elite level closer, right? All star closer. One of the best closers in the league, if not the best closer in the league. Uh, he's still there. Zach Britton used to be one of the better closers in the league, but he's kind of getting older. Uh, see what he brings. He's still got really, really good stuff. Chad Green, he's inconsistent a little bit. He'll give you a little bit more innings, though. He'll go, like, as a starter for you at times. He's still there. Uh, Tommy Canely, who was really good for the Nationals for a few years, bounced around, is in New York. Really good. He's still there. Adam Ottavino coming over from the Rockies. Nasty slider. Got the stuff. He's still there. They don't have Ben Tances, though. Ben Tances was that elite guy that went next to Chapman. They don't have him there, and it did affect him a bit. You can't say it didn't. He didn't throw in 2019. Look at that, that ERA was the lowest it's been since 2007 when they finished with a 4.37 ERA. That bullpen isn't elite anymore. And that's what leads to the pitching staff being 14th in ERA, 5th in strikeouts, 9th in whip, and 11th in batting average against. Now, adding a guy that's uh, just that good in Garrett Cole changes a lot of this, right? I mean, you, you, if you're going to add one person... That's gonna fix your staff. Garrett Cole's that person, All right? So getting him is gonna do a lot of wonders for him. He's gonna eat up a lot more innings. Gonna help out that bullpen, right? Uh, Saying these other guys, Montgomery being healthy, Paxton being healthy, will help out that bullpen. But the reality is the bullpen's getting older and they need to be better because they still have a lot of question marks in the pitching staff. Uh, you can be top level, but if those guys aren't healthy or are throwing their best stuff, you can't just have one pitcher. Right, you can't have just like one starter and one closer and expect to win a postseason series, especially a seven-game series against teams with a little bit more depth. So that's going to be if there's going to be one Achilles heel for the Yankees, it's still going to be that. The lineup, on the other hand, is really good. 
Brock's Bombers, the Sea Yankees, what do you expect? <laughs> Gary Sanchez, their catcher, has some issues defensively. Good arm throwing people out, but some other issues. But he's going to hit for you. Not going to hit for average, 232 average, but he's going to hit 34 bombs, right? 77 RBIs, 841 OPS, solid. Luke Voigt, he had a little bit of injury last year. He's going to get a little bit more exposure. Meathead looks like your prototypical Yankee. Uh, he had 21 home runs, had 842 OPS in a short amount of time. You know, really good at the plate. Uh, G.J. LeMahieu came over from the Rockies. People always say, well, Rockies hitters can't hit outside of Coors Field. Well, D.J. LeMahieu, what did he do in, in New York? Uh, 327 average, 26 home runs, 102 RBIs, 893 OPS, and was in the MVP discussion for much of the year. Gleyber Torres, as I mentioned, came out and made himself a full-fledged superstar at shortstop. 278 average, 38 home runs, 90 RBIs, 871 OPS. Really, really good. Gio Urshela, he came in and stepped in because Miguel Andujar, who was supposed to be their, their everyday third baseman, he gets hurt. In comes Gio Urshela, 314 average, 21 home runs, 74 RBIs, 889 OPS. Solid. Clint Frazier, young guy, prospect, highly regarded prospect, so he's going to get a little bit more time uh, to play this, this coming up year, depending on what some of the other guys do. Uh, he hit 12 home runs, 806 OPS in a limited time. He's going to get a little bit more exposure. Brett Gardner, the veteran type guy, got a lot more playing time with, with a few of these outfielders getting out. Uh, he hit 28 home runs, 829 OPS. He's not getting any younger, but man, the dude just keeps putting up solid numbers for you. Michael Talkman, as we've talked about, the Yankees got him for a um, used soda machine from the Rockies. <laughs> no, a, a reliever that hasn't done anything for the Rockies. They come and get Talkman. Talkman hits 13 home runs, 865 OPS in relief of some of these outfielders. It's the same thing with like, so Gio Urshela, they got him from nothing from Toronto Blue Jays. They go out and they get, um, who is it, Gleber Torres? They, the reason they got, and I've talked about it in the past episodes, they get Gleber Torres, they trade a role as Chapman for the Cubs in 2016. Cubs win the World Series. Gleber Torres is the number one prospect in all of baseball. They get Gleber Torres. Uh, Chapman wins the World Series, plays half a season in Chicago, and then signs back with the Yankees. So they rented Chapman to the Cubs for half a season, and they get Gleber Torres in exchange and that's it's just unfair on how they get some of these guys. Uh, you got to give your hats off to, to Brian Cashman, who's been their GM since '98. Uh, he was their assistant GM in '92, and he's been with the team since '86. Been there forever, and just continues to get it done. I talked about Togman, Frazier, Gardner. The reason why they got a lot of time is because you have guys like Judge, Stanton, and Hicks, who are hurt and not playing. Judge and Stan are MVP level, top five players in the league when they're healthy. Stan has not been that since he's been in New York, and Judge hasn't been there for the last year or two. Still, man, they're so good when they're there. So as a baseball fan, you should be really rooting for them to be there. Uh, I won't get into too much of their numbers. I know Judge still ended up with 30, 378 at-bats, 27 home runs, 921 OPS. But those numbers are going to be nothing compared to if he plays a full, healthy season. And as a baseball fan, I'm all for it. I want to see it. Aaron Hanks brings you that much more defensively. And those will be your starting outfielders, right? I mean, you might slip in Frazier for Stan and have Stan just hit, play DH so you can keep him healthy. Uh, you'll have those guys like um, Brett Gardner bounce around, give these guys rest days, um, give them time to – so they're not playing every day. You have those guys you know that can come in and play really well for you. Brian Talkman, um, those guys. And so they're just deep in the outfield, extremely deep. Uh, but – We'll see what happens. Mike Ford is also a DH type player for them. Miguel Andujar, what does he do? He can play in the outfield, first base, third base. So that I mean, that's what the Yankees do. It's what the the Dodgers, the Red Sox, um, when they're really well, the Cubs, they're they're deep, man. They just they rotate guys in. If guys get hurt or they're slumping, well, here's another guy to throw at you, and they're all really good. So the Yankees offense is just elite. It's just <laughs> unfairly elite. As a team, last year they finished fourth in average. They finished second home runs, only one behind the. The Twins, they hit 306, Twins hit 307. Uh, they finished second RBIs, they hit 904. The Twins, I think, hit 905 or 906. So they were right there as well. Third in OPS and 14 in strikeouts. They don't strike out a lot. They're led by manager Aaron Boone, who is entering his third season as a coach. Very, very, very highly respected. Hit one of the biggest home runs in Yankees' recent, recent memory. I think it was like uh, 2003 when he ripped the... Uh, it was the year before the, the Red Sox won the World Series, I believe. Hit that towering home run. <laughs> off of Wakefield uh, in the postseason. He's known for that, uh, but again, highly respected. Brian Cashman, as we talked about, been with the team since 86. And no surprise, they have the highest payroll in all of baseball at $246.1 million. Not only is it the highest in all of baseball, they're $27.2 higher 
than the next team, which is the Dodgers. They, they just they spend a lot. And they spend a lot of money. Twenty seven point two million is is almost what the <laughs> right. It's like almost half of what the Rays spend on their total roster. It's almost like exactly what the Marlins spend on their roster. And that's just the difference between them and number two. They are uh, over a hundred million above the the mean, <laughs> the median payroll for the league. They have the 22nd ring farm system, and then a big part of that is because they've graduated a lot of people into the, to the majors, right? Uh, Gleber Torres, uh, some of those guys, they're not there anymore. They were highly regarded prospects that helped them be a higher ranked farm system. Uh, now they're down to 22. I'm sure they'll, they'll start building that up again. They have three top 100 prospects, the highest of which is Jason Dominguez, an outfielder, number 54 outfielder. Hard for him. He's not going to be in the leagues for a few years, and there's just no room for him. So uh, Yankees, it's not like... They would like to see some pitching prospects uh, develop <laughs> and join that top 100 because uh, that's what they need. But any offensive prospect, they're just going to continue to develop them and maybe use them as pieces in trade bait. Uh, but that's another thing. Again, I'm not going to go on forever like I did in the, in the podcast. Hopefully it wasn't too long for you guys. Just a lot to talk about with the Yankees. They are the favorite in the American League. They have some question marks as far as pitching goes, but they're very minor uh, compared to everyone else. Uh, I mean, there's yeah, they're elite. Next team up is the Houston Astros, which I would talk about in the same vein, except for, for what happened. If you want to know about the Astros sign stealing gate and their scandal, please go to my podcast and listen to bonus episode one. I go at it. I talk about it at length. So if you want to know more about it, go and do that. The gist of it is because um, this is the YouTube version. You might not have listened to the podcast version. The gist of it is they were using uh, cameras to steal signs. They were using a live feed on the catcher to steal signs and then relay them to the batter so that the batter knew exactly what was going on. Obviously a big no-no. Sign stealing as far as like trying to, to pick up different things on the pitcher has been around since the beginning of time. Using technology to do so is just taking it too far and just something that can't happen, right? There's no art in it. It's just they pretty much, they have the book there and they know exactly what you're doing at all times. And it's just, you can't do it. So Houston finished 107 and 55 last year. They finished first in the American League. They beat the Rays again in the division series in five games. They beat the Yankees in the championship series in six games. And then they went on to the World Series against the Washington Nationals, and they lost in seven games, in, which is a very entertaining uh, World Series. So they lost 5-4 and 12-3 in games one and two. And those numbers seem a little bit further right. 5-4 is close, but 12-3 seems a little further. But a lot of it, these games, the score is not close, but it's because a lot of those runs came in like the, the eighth, ninth inning. Like they were really close and then like a big home run, like a three, four home run in the seventh, eighth inning made it seem like it was a wider margin than what it was. Really, the reality of it is every single game was pretty close for the majority of the game. So they lost 12-3 in game two. They were down 0-2. Then they go to, to Washington. They win games three, four, and five, four, one, eight, one, and seven, one. And then you go back to Houston where they try to wrap it up. They lose 7-2 and 6-2. And the Washington Nationals won the World Series. This became the first seven-game series in championship sports history in all sports where all seven games were won by the road team. And when you finish with the best record in the league and you're the home team for all seven games, that's not the that's not the way you want things to go. <laughs> I mean, usually it's home field advantage and the home team wins all. If there's going to be a way it goes, home team's going to win all games. The away team did. It was kind of crazy. It was very, very entertaining. Uh, their offseason moves, they didn't do any because they just were dealing with a lot as far as the investigation and then the punishments being handed down. They did lose Garrett, uh, Garrett Coles, who mentioned the Yankees. Robinson Torino was a kind of a one-year rental. He, they lost him back to the Rangers, and then they lost the respect of the rest of the league. And it's not just me saying this. You just look at all the big-name guys in Major League Baseball. They've all spoken out about how they were just they lost a lot of respect, and it's just bad. Again, go back to bonus episode one of my podcast. You will... You hear me talk about it at length if you want more details on that. This rotation lost Garrett Cole, the best pitcher in baseball, but they're still really good. They got Justin Verlander, 37 years old, but he ain't slowing down at all. He went 21-6 and last year. He had a 2.58 ERA. He threw in 223 innings, which is a lot, and had 300 strikeouts. Man, him, having him and Garrett Cole last year was just unfair. He had a 0 0.80 whip. How this team lost at all in the World Series is beyond me. Just the Astros hot at the right time. <laughs> that's the only thing that can happen to stop a, a Verlander Cole train. He was a Cy Young Award winner over Garrett Cole, uh, which just shows you how good he was at 37 years old. He pitched in game one against Tampa, seven innings, a hit, eight Ks, three walks. And as you're going to see, he wasn't as good in the postseason, which could be a question for them moving forward. 
Uh, game four against Tampa Bay, he got the loss. He only threw in three and two thirds innings, gave up four runs in that game. Game two against the Yankees, got a no decision, but threw in six and two thirds innings, had two two runs, seven Ks, so decent there. He lost to the Yankees in game five, seven innings, four runs. Lost in game two to the Nationals, six innings, four runs. Lost in game six to the Nationals, five innings, three runs. So he got the innings in, but he went um, one and four. So he, I mean, he was good. Like if you look at the numbers, he wasn't like he was terrible. He just wasn't dominant. And, and that's what they're going to want him to be. You're going to want to be dominant. You want to be this rotation to be that rotation to lead you through to the postseason and to a World Series title again. You're going to want one of your guys to be dominant. The guy that was dominant is gone now. So you have you have Justin Verlander, who was really, really good in the regular season and then good in the postseason. Now, I don't want to say that he was bad in the postseason because that's not the case at all. He was good in the postseason. He just wasn't dominant. Same thing goes for Zach Greinke. Zach Greinke was 8-5 and five in the regular season, 2-9-3 ERA, really good, 208 innings, 187 strikeouts, and a 0-9-8 whip. Very, very good in the regular season. In the postseason, Game 3 against Tampa, 3-2 thirds, 6 runs, loss. Game 1 against the Yankees, 6 innings, 3 runs, loss. Game 4 against the Yankees, 4 and third innings, 1 and run, no decision. Game 3 against the Nationals, 4 and 2 thirds innings, 1 run, 6 Ks, 7 hits, no decision. Game 7 against the Nationals, 6 and a third, 2 runs, 3 Ks, four, 2 walks, and a no decision. And that Game 7 was the best game that he threw in the postseason. He was cruising. He had a low pitch count. And he was doing really well. And this is where A.J. Hinch messed up, the manager for the Astros last year. He should have either kept Garrett Cole going, I mean, uh, Zachary going, or should have brought in Garrett Cole. He decided to go a different direction. Uh, Howie Kendricks comes up with a big home run, and the wheels fall off, and the Astros, they were, who were winning at the time, end up losing the World Series. They end up losing Game 7, 6-2. to two. And they were up 2-1 to one at the time, if you guys remember. I think it was in the 7th inning, 7th and 8th inning. Like I said, there were close games up until the 7th, 8th inning and beyond. And that's when they became, uh, right? Because 6-2 seems like it was like kind of like the Nationals came in and just kicked them around a little bit. Would, it's not the case. It was 2-1 to one for the longest time. They're going to want a little bit more from him in the postseason. Lance McCullers Jr. missed all of last year because he had Tommy John in 2019. If he can be their number three guy, he helps alleviate a lot of the stresses of losing Garrett Cole. Now, he's not anywhere close to Garrett Cole, but he's a solid enough pitcher where you're not going to lose all of Garrett Cole, Cole's production, right? Which is the case if he's not there. He has good, he, and he has really good stuff, but we'll see what he does. Jose Arquiti is a rookie, and um, he did decent for them last year, right? He's 24 years old. He only threw in 41 innings in the regular season, uh, and he was okay in that, that time frame, right? For a young guy, he was really good. But in the postseason, he did really good for them, right? He went four games, got a start, and that start was huge. He pitched game four of the World Series. He got his first start in the postseason, 24 years old, out of Mexico, right? And his story is pretty cool. I talked about it during the World Series in one of my podcasts. Um, he goes five innings, two hits, no runs, and four Ks, and gets himself a win. In the rest of the games, right, he threw in four games. So as a whole in the postseason, he had a 0-9-0 ERA. He threw in 10 innings, so he threw five relief innings in those three games. 12 strikeouts, 1.10 whip. So yeah, very, very encouraging for Kitty, a young guy. Maybe he steps up and be that, that dominant type guy. Uh, Josh James, Austin Pruitt are also options to kind of go to this rotation, see what they got going on. The back of the rotation is going to be a lot of questions of how they fill it out and how they finish it off. Uh, the closer, I'm not going to talk. I've talked about Robert Zuna in the past. I'm not a big fan of him. They just know that the Astros have more issues than just the sign stealing gate. Uh, Zuna is bad reputation with legal troubles as far as his treatment of women. That's all I'm going to get into. If you want to know more, look up Robert Azuna. Uh, not a big fan of him. But still, as a whole, the team did go, and they did bring back uh, one of their top relievers. But pitching total staff, they had an ERA of uh, 366, which finished third in the league. They were second in whip, first in strikeouts, first in batting average against. Now, I expect those to dip because Cole's gone, but they still have Grinky. They still have Verlander. So they're they're going to dip, but they probably won't fall in the top five, I wouldn't imagine. If they do, then they got a lot. <laughs> they got a lot more issues than what's going on. Uh, the lineup is going to have issues. That's just the reality of it. And it's not because the talent isn't there, but you can tell that the mockery and all these things are getting to them. Now, I think if the season would have started on its regular scheduled program, they would have been terrible this year because they're dealing with a lot of these issues. They, that's all they hear about. That's all they're talked about. Every time they go out there, you have all the fans just getting after them. You have the, the PA system playing music to, to mock them. And... It was it was definitely getting to them, and 
if they started regular season, it would have continued to go. But now that they have this stretch, maybe they have the time to kind of sit back and, and reevaluate, right? Okay, we went through it. Now let's get back to business. Let's go out there and let's make something happen. Game one against the Minnesota Twins, he gets a no decision. He goes four and two-thirds innings, five hits, three runs on two home runs, eight Ks, and a walk. So you like the strikeouts. Uh, he didn't quite get to the five-inning mark. They did get the win in that game, but he got a no decision. Uh, solid, but not lights out. Game two against Houston, only two and a third innings, but he only gave up one run on five hits. Again, the postseason is just different than the regular season. Like if, if it's the way the game goes, you may get a quick hook. And if you're not like consistent and dominantly consistent, like guys like Garrett Cole, Justin Verlander, Clayton Kershaw, Walker Bueller, Jake Flaherty, they're going to get a little bit more leash in the postseason compared to really everybody else, right? Luis Severino when he's healthy for the Yankees. And you got to remember that Luis Severino, he pitched a little bit last year. He came in towards the postseason, didn't do much in the postseason, and now he's having Tommy John. Will not pitch in 2020. Will probably be out for maybe the start of 2021, uh, depending on when his rehab kind of goes and how his arm reacts to it. Uh, but you're going to get a quicker hook in the postseason. Game five against Houston was his best game of the postseason. He went six innings. Four hits, a run, uh, nine Ks, and four walks. Got the win. Helped extend the series, get it back to game six, where the Astros would eventually win. But he kept that series alive. And the, the Yankees did have a shot there in game six. Marse Masahiro Tanaka is a veteran guy. He's not going to give you a lot, but he's going to eat up innings. And if he's your number three and number four, whenever um, depending on what John, Jordan Montgomery does, and if Luis Severino comes back, He's gonna be. He's a solid number four, number five, veteran guy, well liked. Just gets the job done. So in the regular season, it was eh, four point four five ERA, one hundred eighty two innings, which you like, right? Just eight up innings, not gonna blow you away. But in the postseason, he gets you outs, man. He just gets the job done. He's had a history of just getting it done in the postseason for a long time for the Yankees. Game two against Minnesota is his first game. He goes five innings, one run, seven Ks, and a walk. Gets the win. Game one against Houston, as we mentioned, they came out swinging in game one, one seven nothing. It was behind Tanaka. Six innings, one hit, no runs, four Ks, and a walk gets the win. Game four was his worst outing, but still wasn't terrible. So he goes five innings. He gives up four runs, only three of them earned. He only has one strikeout and two walks. So again, not terrible, not great. But his postseason as a whole is just good because Tanaka gets it done in the postseason. And if they can get there, you'd love to have Sevi there. But if Paxton, Cole, Tanaka are healthy, you feel a lot better. Jay Happ may fill in that number four spot for them this year. Uh, he threw 161 innings, didn't have a great ERA, didn't have great strikeout numbers or whip numbers, but he's going to eat up innings. He's a veteran guy going to eat up innings, and you need those, as I mentioned. Uh, same with Trapiano for them and, and Bettis if they end up coming up. There's just going to be innings in here. So get me out, right? Keep this bullpen going. Uh, don't wear out my bullpen. Don't wear out my other starters. Just get outs. Get innings. Eat them up. Because the offense is going to take care of a lot of these things anyways, right? If they don't have great ERAs, the offense is good enough where it's just going to take care of it. He pitched in relief in three games in the postseason, ended up with a 2-4-5 ERA. He had three and two-thirds innings uh, pitched, three Ks, uh, 1.09 whip. So he was pretty good of that for them out of the bullpen in the postseason. And that's probably where he's going to end up again if he does make the postseason roster. The guy that's going to be interesting, one, as I mentioned, is going to be Jordan Montgomery. Really good, very, very highly regarded prospect. Coming off of Tommy John, which he had last March, See what he brings to the table because if he's healthy and he develops like they kind of hope he would, he takes away a lot of those issues. He, he takes away a lot of stress on that, that rotation. So that'll be interesting to see. The bullpen side of things, as I mentioned, let's talk about the bullpen. So you have Chapman there, really good elite closer. You have Zach Britton, you have Chad Green, Tommy Canley, Adam Adovino, really good arms with really good stuff. But the bullpen wasn't that great last year as far as like an elite level defense like everyone thinks of. So everyone, all Yankees fans, you'll hear them. Most baseball fans go, ah, they don't really need the rotation because the bullpen is just that dominant. Well, that dominant defense, that bullpen ended up ninth in ERA in Major League Baseball last year. That's not a dominant rotation. They had a 408 ERA. That's not a dominant bullpen, right? That's their highest bullpen ERA since 2007 when they had a 437. If things don't bounce around, bounce back, they're really going to rely on that rotation, man. And that, that rotation isn't good enough to carry them. Let's just be honest with you. Garrett Cole alleviates, alleviates a lot of that pressure, right? Changes things around. But not having Severino there is a big blow. And if Paxton's not healthy, that's a big blow. Tanaka's not getting any younger. So Chapman's going to be good again. Britton is a little bit older to see how he bounces back. Chad Green's interesting, man. There's times he looks good. Can eat a bending free. There's other times where he just gets knocked around. Same with Tommy Kingley. Adam Ottavino, when his slider's on, he's untouchable. How consistent can these guys be? Who else can step in? 
that guy that would carry this it would be Chapman, it would be Ben Tanzen's. Ben Tanzen's not being there is having a bigger effect than people think it is. Now, I'm not saying that the Yankees are going to struggle and they're going to lose because their bullpen is not good. Because their bullpen is still salt, right? It's still top 10. It's just not elite. And they're still going to be good because, well, the offense. And now they have Garrett Cole. Total pitching staff, they had finished 14th in ERA. Not great for a playoff team. Fifth in strikeouts, which is good. And they're probably going to improve upon that when you had a 300-plus strikeout guy in Garrett Cole. Their whip was tight for ninth. Not great. And they were 11th in batting average against. Not great. Again, Cole helps out a lot of this. A lot of it, right? I mean, if you're going to add one player to change around a uh, pitching staff to make them better, Garrett Cole's that one guy. So he's going to help out a lot of that. But there's still question marks around him. The lineup, on the other hand, there's not a lot of question marks. These guys just hit. They're the Bronx Bombers for a reason. Gary Sanchez is your catcher. And although he can be iffy at times, an average 232 and defensively, good arm throwing people out, but there's other issues defensively. He's going to hit 34 plus home runs. He had an 841 OPS. He'll take it. Luke Voigt at first base, kind of a meathead. Looks like your prototypical Yankee. <laughs> he had 21 home runs. He had 842 OPS. And I think those home run numbers are probably going to go up a little bit as he stays healthy. Aaron Judge, John Carlos Stanton, Aaron Hicks. Aaron Judge is an MVP top five player in the league if he's healthy. He hasn't been healthy the last few years. John Carlos Stanton could be a top five player in the league MVP type candidate if he's healthy. Hasn't been healthy the last few years. As a baseball fan, you should want to see these guys be healthy, and it's tough, right? And Aaron Hicks in the same vein. He was healthy. He didn't play a whole lot last year anyways, but it's really good defensively in center field. He made one of the best defensive plays that I saw all of last year. They're playing the Twins in a really good game. I think it was August or September, and he makes a diving catch in center field to end the game. It was an amazing catch, amazing play, an exciting game. It was a fun game to watch. Um, and those guys just being out and hurt. You had young guys, like I talked about the Yankees being big beneficiaries of – this break rise, right, they can get healthy, but the Astros are the same way because they're good. They are really good offensively. It's like the, the issues with the Astros, as far as the science ceiling goes, is people aren't saying they don't have the talent because the talent is obviously there. Like they, they are extremely talented offensively. That's how this team was built. They went out and got Verlander. They went out and got Cole. They went out and got Grinky. It was built from the beginning based on this offense and this defense. Their position players. So people aren't questioning that. So maybe, again, now that they've had a chance to deal with the heckling, they've done with these things, they've been able to, to sit back, take a deep breath, and then come back out and play. Because they are still an elite-level team, right? A team total stats last year, they finished number one in average, number three in home runs, number three in RBIs, number one in OPS, and dead last in the amount of times that they struck out. Now, how much of this was helped out by some of the sign stealing? I, I don't know. They weren't convicted for 2019, so we don't know exactly what happened. There's a lot of speculation and rumors about buzzers being used, about different things happening in 2019. There's no definitive proof on any of those things. So we don't know what they did. We know that they still hit during the postseason, a lot of them, though, and that it was not used during the postseason outside of the 2017 season. Because in 2018 and 2019, Major League Baseball started to put delays, and they also started to put Major League staff, personnel, all throughout the stadium to prevent these things because the rumors were happening long before the investigation took place. So they can still they can still hit, right? They're led by Martin Maldonado. Um, well, not led by Martin. <laughs> he's going to step in for Robinson Torino at the... <laughs> he's just the first guy I have on the list. Um, he's, he's not going to do much for you def offensively, but he's going to be a solid backstop for you. He has played better in Houston than he has uh, other places. Uh, maybe, I mean, maybe there's something to it. <laughs> but uh, he's going to be your backstop now that Torino's is gone. Yuri Gurriel, he was a rookie in 2017. I'm not the biggest fan of Gurriel, but he is a solid player, right? He had 298 last year, 31 home runs, 104 RBIs, 884 OPS, solid. Jose Altuve is long known to be solid. MVP in 2017, mm, say whether you will. Uh, we used to be a huge fan of Altuve right now. and We'll see what happens moving forward. Uh, 298 average, 31 home runs, 903 OPS, solid year last year. George Springer, he's going to be a free agent this offseason. And, and that's another thing I'm curious to see what happens, right, is these Astros players now have this stigma over them, and they're, right, they're, there's a lot of respect lost for them, and they're looked at in a different vein. Last year, if you told me Springer's becoming a free agent, he was, for sure he was going to get a big-time contract. Teams are going to be fighting over who he signed with. Now... I don't know. How much does this affect his, his offseason, right? How does this affect teams, players wanting to sign with the Astros? And how does this affect uh, the players from the Astros wanting to sign somewhere else? That's yet to be seen. That's going to be the first thing to be seen with George Springer. 
Last year in 2019, he hit 292. He had 39 home runs, 96 RBIs, and a 974 OPS. He puts up numbers like that. People are going to sign him regardless, right? He bounces back in 2020 and, and does that again. Yeah, yeah. Especially what he's done in the postseason. He, teams aren't going to care about the rest of it. The guy can just flat out rake. Uh, Alex Bregman, again, MVP runner-up. If he was going to be a free agent, which is not going to be for a few more years, people were going to get him. He was a runner-up for the MVP for a reason. He had 296, 41 home runs, 112 RBIs, 1.015 OPS. And that 3-4 in that lineup, or 2-3 probably what those guys are going to be, nasty. Nasty in Springer and Bregman. Carlos Correa fits in behind him, and he's the one that's kind of regressed the most and has dealt with this the, the worst, in my opinion. He's just acted like a baby about all of it. Again, that's just my opinion. Uh, he looked terrible <laughs> in spring, but he had 279, 21 home runs, uh, 926 OPS, which is solid. His defense has kind of waned a little bit, but still solid. Jordan Alvarez. Now, he is a guy that came in last year and is a, I wasn't a part of it, but I can hit. He's 22 years old, and the Astros flat out fleeced the Dodgers in this, in this trade. They got Jordan Alvarez for Josh Fields, a reliever that didn't really even pitch for the Dodgers and was let go. And Jordan Alvarez, all he did was hit 313, 27 home runs, a 1.067 OPS, and he hit a home run in Minute Maid Field where nobody has ever hit a home run. It was like three decks up. It was the bleacher seats. People got it for cheap. They weren't expecting to even get touched by a ball. And then here comes Jordan Alvarez just putting, yeah. You can look up that video. That home run was hit long, long ways. Uh, and he's a big man. <laughs> and he's only 22 years old. So, I mean, again, this, this lineup isn't, it's not like this lineup is bad. It's just how does it affect them mentally? What do they do mentally? And if they were using that sign stealing, it, are they going to regress because of it? Those are going to be the big questions. Michael Brantley, a veteran, highly respected outfielder, wasn't also, also wasn't there during that 2017 season. So how much a part of it was he? Uh, you don't know. He's highly respected. Uh, nothing has ever been brought up against him. So you got to think that he wasn't a part of it. He hit 311 last year, 22 home runs, 90 home runs, 875 OPS, solid. Uh, Josh Reddick definitely was a part of it, big part of it. Not a big fan of Josh Reddick either uh, for various reasons. <laughs> but he's a solid outfielder. He's going to be there as a kind of a, a utility type player. He's going to fit in where they need him. Uh, same with uh, Almedes Diaz. He's going to kind of fit in where they fit in. And then Kyle Tucker, a younger guy, highly respected. They're going to kind of fit in to help that offense out. Again, the question is not the talent. The question is how do they bounce back and how do they react to pitchers throwing at them, which is going to happen. I know the major leagues told them not to. Dusty Baker came out and said, don't throw at my players. Uh, all those different things. It's going to happen. They're, they're, they're not well liked. They're going to see people's best stuff. People are going to be coming after them. They're going to hear it from the fans. They're going to hear it from the media still. When this thing bounces back, it's not going to go away. How do they handle it mentally? That's going to be the biggest question for the Astros. Another thing they're going to have to deal with is that their division has gotten much better. The A's are getting better, as we mentioned. The Angels got better. They got Rendon. They're going to get continue to get better as Otani gets healthy. Uh, they still have the best player in the world in Mike Trout. How do they handle all those things? Also, they have a new manager. They have a new general manager. AJ Hinch was their manager for a couple years, since 2017 or 2016. He got suspended for a year because of the sign stealing gate. He was subsequently let go. Jeff Lunau has been there also since AJ Hinch has been there. Um, he was suspended for a year, subsequently let go as well. So now they're replacing those two. They bring in Dusty Baker, a highly, highly, highly respected manager in the game. Um, he's been around for a long time, beloved and respected by everybody. And that's the reason, I mean, there's a reason they brought in Dusty Baker. Like he was the perfect fit. They have an image problem. Let's bring in a guy who has the opposite of that. Like nobody has anything bad to say about Dusty Baker. And he's a veteran guy that's going to kind of keep these younger guys in check. He was with the Giants for a long time, with Barry Bonds was there. Uh, he was in Chicago for a little bit. He was in there in Washington during the Bryce Harper days, right before Dave Martinez took over to a couple years ago. Um, so he's, he's if there's a guy that's going to come in and help them navigate through this year, it's going to be Dusty Baker. It was just a great hire by them. Uh, James Click came over from Tampa Bay. As we mentioned, Tampa Bay just pumps out executives. Uh, let's see what he does in his first year as a GM. Um, they, they didn't make any moves this offseason again, but this next offseason is going to be really telling for how they move forward after all this. They are third highest payroll in Major League Baseball, right? Goes Yankees, Dodgers, and then the Astros. They're at 206.8 million, which is 70 million over the um, 73, 76 million. <laughs> 76 million over the league median. Uh, so they do spend money and they have money to spend and they keep getting fans coming in. Minute Maid's a beautiful park. They've done renovations to it the last few years. I went to it um, five years ago 
And when they used to have the hill in center field, that, that's gone. They've done a lot more to it. I definitely want to go back and see it. Uh, maybe if I'm going to boo them or not. <laughs> that's definitely a park that I want to go back to, one of the parks I have been to. They have the 28th ring farm system, so their farm system isn't very good. Uh, Jose Urquidy Jose still qualifies as a rookie, which, which helps that, right? Uh, and then Forrest Whiteley is a young right-handed pitcher. I think he's their only top 100 prospect. He's been talked about for quite some time. He is highly regarded, and they do need pitching, so that, that helps out as well, right? The, the two young guys being pitchers helps them out a lot. Again, biggest question for them. They definitely want to build that farm system moving forward. Do they bring Springer back? Uh, how much do they bring him back for? And how do they look mentally in 2019 or 2020? That's going to be the biggest question for the Astros that are an extremely talented team. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see. Uh, it's definitely going to define what the 2020 season looks like is what the Astros look like because they've been the class of Major League Baseball in the American League for a few years now. They were the model franchise, and that's just not the case anymore. How do they do moving forward? Because the talent... Is still there. Okay, I'm going to add my top 10 list in here for top 10 baseball movies because I've seen a lot of lists put, put out there. I've seen a lot of uh, different uh, brackets and stuff like that. So I want to send my own out there. But I'm going to be quicker on this one than I am in the podcast version uh, for just a few reasons. I just don't want to elongate these YouTube videos just yet. Number one for me. So my number one through five is solid. I'm stuck with my number five. It's after number five, right? It's, um, it's six through 10 that are the ones that are kind of up in the air for me so <laughs> uh, let me know again give me your feedback on this because i want to know what you guys think about top 10 baseball movies uh, number one for me feel the dreams obvious reasons just an amazing movie number two is major league uh, i love that movie growing up still do um actually the the spring training facility that they have during the game where um you have willie mays hayes pulling up to the stadium right or he's a uh, yeah for the first time he's falling asleep and and uh, the the because they moved his bed outside and he's going out there running with him. All that happens at High Corbett. That's going to be one of the fields that I'm covering in the next episode. As far as like old spring training facilities, Bull Durham is next for me. And there actually is a minor league team called the Burt Durham Bulls, and they celebrate Bull Durham Night every year. It's amazing. It's a great movie. It's another Kevin Costner movie, right? He's in Field of Dreams as well. Uh, Bull Durham is great. Uh, Sandlot or a League of Their Own is number four. Another classic. Tom Hanks. Right, uh, and it's a historically based movie, and I would love to do an episode of that. That in fact, uh, my wife and one of our good friends, we have that idea of, of getting them on here. Right, uh, two two women that really do enjoy baseball and love baseball, talking about the era of a league of their own and how um, women took over and started playing games for these guys because it is a historically based movie, and there are some young prospects that uh, are female that may make it to the major leagues that are really, really good and, and, and highly regarded. So that'd be an interesting episode to kind of have, uh, get them on here and talk about that a little bit. Sandlot, classic, obviously. It uh, brings back the nostalgia. It, I, everyone's watched it growing up if you're a baseball fan. It's, it's something I, I really enjoy. So <laughs> uh, that's got to be my top five. But again, after this, it gets a little dicey. So we have Rookie of the Year. Love that movie, right? Uh, Rosenbaga. Rosen Gardner. <laughs> if you ever seen that movie, you know what I mean. The, the, the manager that just continues to mispronounce his name. You have the kooky um, uh, bench coach, all those different things. Um, it's in the same vein of like Little Big League, and I almost had a Little Big League there, right? The young guy that, that uh, his grandpa owned the Minnesota Twins. He passes away and then um, wills it to him. So it's <laughs> an interesting movie, fun movies for kids. Uh, I do like those movies. Number seven for me is Moneyball. Now, Moneyball is a really well done movie, right? It's got Brad Pitt, it's got uh, um, Jonah Hill. The only reason I don't put it in my top five because it, it's like right there on the door is it just completely ignores the fact that Miguel Tejada was on that team, MVP in the American League that year. Uh, completely ignores the fact that the A's had the, one of the best rotations in all of baseball. Like their number one through three was nasty. You got Barry Zito, Tim Hudson, and Mark Mulder. Just a nasty one, two, three. That's the kind of the A's are. They continue to try to build a rotation that looks like that. That's what they're looking at. Uh, Manaya, Montes, Puck, Luriano even, to be that kind of next 1-3 punch and even 1-4 with that, those guys. Um, Eight Men Out is a really good one, and that's about the Black Sox scandal. I definitely want to do an episode on the Black Sox scandal. It's one of the biggest scandals in sports history. The Black Sox were highly regarded as the best team ever assembled. Even like nowadays, people like think of them like, I mean, you think of Murder's Row, obviously, and I definitely want to do an episode of Murder's Row, the Yankees, the, um, but the Black Sox still was, I mean, they had Shoeless Joe, they had a lot of big name guys in 
they threw the World Series. They purposely lost the World Series because their owner was greedy. They didn't want to pay them. Some gamblers paid them a lot of money to throw the World Series, and they did that as the greatest team ever assembled in baseball at the time. Uh, very interesting story, and that covers it. It's got a lot of cool actors in there, too. It's got Charlie Sheen. It's got John Cusack. It's got a lot of other names that I can't think of right now, <laughs> but it's a cool little movie. Uh, Bang the Drum Slowly is another old school style movie that I really enjoy watching. It's a classic. It's highly regarded as one of the best baseball movies ever made. If you see like normal list, you'll see Field of Dreams, you'll see A Man Out, you'll see Bang the Drum Slowly on there. Fever Pitch is number 10 for me. Now, I didn't watch Fever Pitch until I was a little bit older. My wife introduced me to it anyways. <laughs> but I do like romantic comedies and it talks about the 04 Yankees that won the first or Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Red Sox fans. The 04 Red Sox. They won the World Series, breaking the curse of the Bambino, right? 100 years without a championship. And Fever Pitch kind of follows it around with um, Jimmy Fallon and Drew Barrymore. It's a fun movie. Um, you guys, I enjoyed it, so you guys might enjoy it as well. Movies that did make the list that are honorable mentions for me Mr. 3000 with Bernie Mac. I. We've always liked that movie. I like Bernie Mac a lot, though. So it's, and it's a very well-done movie. It really is a good movie. I do like it a lot about the Brewers. That guy has to, he one hit away from 3,000, so he comes back to try to get it. Uh, <laughs> uh, good movie. Um, Bad News Bears. People are going to be mad at me for not including Bad News Bears, but for me, it's not in my top 10. So this is my list. I can make it however I want. So Bad News Bears, classic. I do enjoy it. Not in my top 10, so yeah, get over it. Battered Bastards of Baseball is another one that I, I wanted to include. It's on Netflix. It's a documentary. Russell Crowe's dad bought a minor league team in Portland one year. Russell Crowe played for it when he was younger. I think this was back in the 80s. And they were the only team since... I don't know if they were the only team, but they were like the, the only team in the last like 100 years to be a minor league team not affiliated with a major league ball club. So they played in the minor league league. They played in a league. I think it was the Pacific Coast League, which is a minor league affiliate to Major League Baseball. But they weren't affiliated to any teams. And they were going out and they were actually beating this team. It's a very, very fun documentary. Uh, it happened one year. It's a very cool story. Um, definitely worth the watch. Uh, but that's my top 10 list. Again, if you like it, let me know. If there's, there's movies I left out, didn't mention, let me know. If there's whatever. This is my team. My, this, is my <laughs> this is my list. My top 10. Let me know yours. And that'll do it for episode 3 YouTube pot hacks only. I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope this kind of improves upon it. Maybe I'm getting a little bit better talking in front of the camera. Maybe I'm doing a little bit more of a... This is a different one too than the one we did. So we did the first two were uh, non kind of um, on the field specific as they were the, the spring training history, right? And then the terminology point. Uh, I did do a safety episode that I want to rehash that I will do for the YouTube channel. Um, so that'll be that kind of episode. This is the first of the um, what teams have and what they have going forward of... The YouTube version. I have a lot of them on the podcast version. I'm finally moving over to the YouTube version. Hope you guys enjoy it. Again, give me all your feedback. Give me all of it. I want all of it. Whatever it is, good, bad, indifferent. Just let me know what you think and let me know where I can improve. Let me know where I do well. So, and all my information is right there. It, it will always be there in every episode, right? Twitter, Instagram, email, website, all those things right there. Also, right here is a like button, thumbs up. Go ahead and hit it. Just quick tap. <laughs> the subscribe right to right next to my name go ahead and hit that real quick too uh, they help grow the show they help you guys know whenever i'm putting out episodes um hope you guys enjoy it and we'll talk to you soon